Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know you've got so much more inside you. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today, let's live your best belief life and get some incredible motivation from the one and only Joe Dispenza. Enjoy. Change is so hard. So then let's offer another alternative. Well, when you begin to create from the field instead of from matter, the only way you can do that is you have to learn how to take all of your attention off your body and become a nobody. Take all of your attention off all the people in your life that you give so much of your attention and energy to because you have an emotion associated with them. And get beyond all the people in your life and go from a someone to a no one. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've worked your whole life being a someone, or if you've been working your whole life thinking that you're your body, you're going to have to work a little harder because that's your identity. Sure. That's what you're associated with. And it's a it, long time of conditioning it's that a you long have to time unwind. Of conditioning. And if this was easy, everybody <laughs> would be doing it. So then you have to go get beyond all the things in your life, your cell phone, your computer, your car, and literally go from something to nothing. You have to take all your attention off the place you work, the place you live, the place you need to be, the place you're sitting, and go from somewhere to nowhere. You gotta stop thinking about the predictable future and the familiar past, and go right into the present moment and go from some time to no time. And if you do that properly, you become pure consciousness. And that's how you enter the field. Mm. Now, we've done the research on this. We call it getting beyond the self. Now, once you are pure consciousness, you're taking all of your attention off this three-dimensional reality. Now, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you've taken all of your attention off of everything material, there's only one place you're going to wind up, and that is the in immaterial realm called the quantum field, an invisible field of energy that unifies and connects everything material. So now when you're creating from the field and you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion and you're connected and you feel connected, the suggestion of an alternative way to create is that when there's a vibrational match between your energy and some future reality, you actually no longer have to go anywhere to get it. You're actually the vortex, and you will collapse space and time and draw the experience to you. Now that, to me, is a lot more fun mm. because the experience is the unknown. You can't predict when it's gonna happen or how it's gonna happen, because if you can predict it, it's the known. So then you have to lay down the very thing you use your whole life to get what you want for something greater to occur. Now that goes against generations untold of conditioning and a lifetime of habituation, believing that we're, we're trapped in this material world. And yet I can, I can say to you without a doubt that once you understand that formula, and once you know how to create that kind of brain and heart coherence, the side effect of that is a change in biology, neurologically, chemically, hormonally, genetically. We've measured it. We've seen gene regulation changes in four days. More brain coherence, more heart coherence. Your brain's working better. Your heart is, you're trusting your heart. It's open. There's different chemicals that are released. Oxytocin suppresses survival centers, resets the baseline of a person's trauma or shock. Your immune system goes up. Mm -hmm. You're, you, you lengthen your telomeres. We've measured that too. So you're changing the future of your body. You're extending your life. That's evidence, right? So we, we have the evidence to know that it could happen because we've measured it. But the real evidence is watching the testimonial of someone who says, I had stage four cancer. I was told as a 41-year-old woman that I wouldn't live for more than two months. And I have no evidence of cancer in my body at all. Or someone that's a physician who has Parkinson's disease that's tried everything from the medical route and has one transcendental moment and their tremors and their pain are gone. Then now they're chewing food, they're swallowing, uh, they're blowing their nose, they're standing up on their own. Uh, that's energy affecting matter. So we have hundreds and hundreds of testimonials of people that not only heal their body, but created pr pretty profoundly magical things in their life. So you have evidence in the scientific world, you have evidence in the practical world, and evidence is the loudest voice right now.
the brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything we've learned and experienced to this moment. So <clears throat> most people wake up in the morning and they think about their problems and their problems are memories that are etched in their brain that are connected to certain people and certain uh, problems at certain times and certain places. And the moment they start thinking of their problems, they're thinking in the past. The challenge is that every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. And emotions really are a record of the past. So the moment you feel unhappy, the moment you feel suffering, the moment you feel fear, now your body's in the past. So it's the thought being the language of the brain and the feeling being the language of the body and how we think and how we feel creates our state of being. So many people reaffirm their state of being completely uh, by the past. And so it only takes a thought and a feeling, an image and emotion, a stimulus and response to start the conditioning process. So we start to condition the brain and body, hardwire the brain, condition the body emotionally into the past. The problem is the body's so objective that it doesn't know the difference between the real life experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion we're creating by memory alone. The body's believing it's living in the same past environment, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So then the person gets up and then they run through the same routine as they always do. And uh, in time, their body moves into a state of autopilot. Now their body is a set of programs, a habit that's dragging them into the same future based on what they did in the past. And so to change them also requires being greater than the emotions that have been conditioned into the body and the habituations that have been conditioned into the body in the predictable future. So we have to understand then that, that change requires not only being greater than the environment, but also being greater than our body, which is really for the most part been conditioned to be the mind. That's what a habit is. So then to change then, to be greater than the body, to be greater than the environment and be greater than time, instead of living in the familiar past, which is the known and the predictable future, which is the known, you teach people how to settle into the present moment. And that's the unknown. And most people that the unknown represents a very threatening place. And so when people start to do meditation, as an example, and their body starts looking for an arousal, or wants to get up and do things, they think they can't meditate. But in fact, if they can settle their body back down into the present moment and lower the volume to that anger, to that frustration, to the fear, to the sadness, <laughs> it's like training an animal. Now you're telling the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind. And our research shows there's a liberation of energy. The body starts expanding and relaxing into the present moment. Instead of getting up and checking your cell phone or doing something, and you notice that propensity, instead of responding to it and say, I can't meditate, you settle your body back down into the, the present moment. Now you're executing a will that's greater than the program because most people lose their free will to a set of programs. And it's the act of doing this to be greater than the conditions of our environment, to be greater than our body as the mind and, and to be greater than time that all of a sudden causes the person to start believing in themselves a little bit more. And that's when um, possibility starts to unfold. If your brain is a record of the past and you are living by the same emotions that have defined you for the last 10 years, and you keep thinking the same thoughts that make the same chemicals and those same chemicals drive the same thoughts, then your body as the unconscious mind does not know the difference between an actual experience in your life that creates an emotion and an emotion that you're creating by thought alone. And so your body is believing it's in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and your body is programmed into the past. And you can't create a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. How many people understand what I'm talking about? So then, when you react to someone or something in your life, you have a choice that when an event changes how you feel, there's a chemical change that's taking place in your body. And most people don't think they can control their emotional reactions. And so then when you react to some coworker or some relative or somebody in traffic, 
The moment you react emotionally, you are altered chemically. And if you don't know how to control your emotional reaction after that event, and you allow those emotions to linger for hours or days, you know what that's called? That's called a mood. Hey, Juanito, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm in a mood. Really? Why are you in a mood? Well, this thing happened to me four days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. And if you keep that same refractory period going on for weeks or months, that's called a temperament. Hey, why is she so angry? I don't know. Why are you so angry? Why are you so bitter? Why are you so enchilada? <laughs> because I had this experience seven months ago and I'm memorizing my emotional reaction. And if you keep that same refractory period going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And people wear their emotions on their sleeve and that's who they think they are. And they will talk about the past to validate why they're not creating the life that they want. So then if you wake up in the morning, Mexico City, and you are not being defined by a vision that's bigger than you, and it doesn't get you out of bed and inspire you into possibility, and you get up living from the old hardware of the past and the old emotions stored in your body, do you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to wake up and you're going to open your eyes and you're going to see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time. And the moment you open your eyes, all of a sudden now, it's your external environment that's controlling how you think and feel. Because you have a neurological network in your brain for every person you know, every place that you go, everything that you own, everything that you do. And the moment you open your eyes and you see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's your external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain, causing you to think equal to everything that you know. And you told me you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny. And as long as you're th thinking equal to your environment, you keep creating the same life. To change, to truly change, is to think greater than your environment, to think greater than the circumstances in your life, to think greater than the conditions in your world, and every great person in history knew this, whether it was Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the Wright brothers, Joan of Arc. They all had a vision. When was the last time you sat with your heart and just mm. worked with it, mm. like so that it's not contracted and afraid and protected? Mm. It takes practice to, to do that. And, and so we, we, we work with people in letting them uh, we give them numerous opportunities mm. to practice this over and over and over again. And sooner or later, petal by petal, it starts to bloom. And all of a sudden, there's an authentic smile on their face. And once energy me meets the heart, it goes right to the brain. We, have, we did this study where we hooked up an electrocardiogram to an electroencephalogram. And an electroencephalogram is a brain mapping machine. So we measure 19 or 26 different compartments and we're looking to see all different kind of activity in the brain. But we measured the heart along with it, and when the heart starts beating coherently, in, in a sense of order, like, a, like taking a big sheet, Jay, and going like that, the heart sends a wave right up to the brain, and the brain goes into these beautiful states of alpha. The heart is telling the brain it's safe to create again. It's safe to imagine. It's safe to dream of a new future. And 
There's the stroke volume of the heart in order, and then you see these two or three seconds of beautiful, coherent alpha. The brain is in, it's, it's in that creative state. Then there's a pause, and it happens again, and yeah, it's, it's, it's beauty, it's a, it's a symphony. If you don't have that mechanism, you can have all the intention in the world, but mm-hmm. there's no carrier wave. I mean, and people, when they make energy uh, reach their heart, there's an external field that's created. It's, it's, it's magnetic, it's, it's, it's measurable. Mm. And that energy is frequency, and if that frequency is coherent, it can carry the intent or thought on a coherent brain of that future. The energy of suffering cannot carry the thought of health or wealth. It's not consistent with it. It carries a different set of thoughts. So then the training then is getting people into those hard states because once they start trading that fear or that pain or that frustration or trying or whatever, forcing you know, control for gratitude, and they just let all that go. And I say to them, listen, if you can't feel gratitude, if you can't feel love, I just want to know what you've been practicing feeling every day. Because mm. that feeling that you're practicing is what you're always feeling. Now let's practice feeling something else. In the beginning, <laughs> it's not going to be easy, but you got to keep following the formula, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Well, when they start feeling gratitude, it's very interesting because the emotional signature of gratitude is that something wonderful just happened to you something favorable is happening to you, right? So you've just received something or you're receiving something, you say thank you. So gratitude is the ultimate state of receiving emotionally. Mm -hmm. So when you move into a state of gratitude and you open your heart, you will accept, believe, and surrender to the thoughts equal to that emotional state and you'll program your autonomic nervous system into a different destiny. You could say, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, and your body is conditioned into misery and it's saying, no, you're not. And that thought stops right at the brainstem. Mm -hmm. It never makes it to the body because the body is on a different program. So then, while the person starts trading that and they start opening their heart, Well, their immune system gets stronger by 50%. 50% in three days, they start making immunoglobulins. Their body's natural defense against viruses and bacteria is 50%, not a little bit, a lot. That's, That's one study. And so trading that, telling the body it's in the in the environment where it already happened. Mm. And so that's when the miracles start happening. That's when people say, I'm not doing anything. Well, of course you're not. (laughs) You don't have to. Your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's listening to this podcast has created the present personal reality called their life. So if you believe what I just said, then in order for you to create a new personal reality, a new life, you're going to have to change your personality. In other words, nothing changes in your life until you change. That's the way it is. So it turns out the 90% of the thoughts that we think on a daily basis are the same thoughts as the day before. Same thoughts lead to the same choices. Same choices lead to the same behaviors. Same behaviors create the same experiences. The same experiences produce the same feelings and the same emotions. And those same feelings and emotions begin to influence our very same thoughts. And our biology, our neurocircuitry, our neurochemistry, our hormones, our gene expression, our immune system, all stay the same because we're staying the same. So then there's a principle in neuroscience that says that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. You keep thinking the same thoughts, you keep making the same choices, you keep doing the same things, you keep creating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same exact patterns, all for the reaffirming of the same feeling. And you do that for 10 years on end. The firing and wiring of those circuitry begins to hardwire the brain into a very finite signature. That box in the brain that's created is the same level of mind. And if you keep doing that, it becomes automatic. It turns out that 95% of who we are by the time we're in the middle of our life is a set of memorized behaviors, automatic emotional reactions, constant habits, 
hardwired attitudes, beliefs, perceptions that have happened just because we've, we've just fired and wired it the same way. So there's a good possibility then in order for us to change, we better start thinking about what we've been thinking about in changing. We have to become conscious of our unconscious habits and behaviors and modify them. We got to look at these feelings that we feel every single day and instead of just thinking it's a feeling say what is this is this guilt is this sadness is this unhappiness is this pain is it frustration is it resentment what is the feeling that i'm living by the majority of my day now that's lighting a match in a dark place in neuroscience it's called metacognition the word meditation means to become familiar with. That's what it means. So the more familiar with you are, I can't with, I can't, it's too hard. I'm never going to change. It's my ex's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's my country's fault. It's the government. It's the weather. It's my pain. Whatever that thought is that you accept, believe and surrender to on a daily basis, that's automatic. You have to become so conscious of that unconscious thought that it doesn't slip by your awareness unnoticed. You gotta catch yourself saying, I'm tired, I'm unhappy, it's someone else's fault. Do you complain, do you blame, do you make excuses, do you feel sorry for yourself? That that personality has to change in order to create a new life. So then you have to become so aware of your unconscious habits that you don't go unconscious to them in your waking day. Then you gotta sit in the fire of those emotions and you got to watch those emotions come up and you have to sit with them and know that there's something on the other side of them. Now, this is where most people get up and say, I can't meditate or I'm going to call up my friend or I'm going to get on social media and make a post. I'm going to turn on the football game. I'm going to get distracted because (laughs) I need something out there to make this go away. And what we're saying is we're not relying on anything out there. That's the That's the hypnosis, that's the conditioning. We want you to just become so familiar with that feeling that you catch yourself in your waking day, the moment you start feeling sad and your energy drops, ah, you catch yourself. So there's an unlearning process or a breaking the habit of being the old self process that requires a lot of attention, a lot of awareness, and it takes energy. You gotta stay conscious, right? If you think about great leaders in history that changed the course of many different cultures, uh, what they did that was so important is they had a vision of that future. And they were able to have other people come out of their resting emotional state uh, and begin to see that vision that they were seeing and move them into an elevated emotional state. And when they change their energy, those people could share that same vision. Well, if you combine a clear intention and an elevated emotion, those two ingredients change people's state of being. Now the person has just moved biologically from living in the past to living in a new future in the present moment. And that's what caused millions of people to begin to make different choices, to behave differently, to do different things. And if you get enough people doing that because of mirror neurons, everybody's observing everybody do it and you create a collective consciousness and great leaders have the ability to, based on core principles, whether it's justice or freedom or equality, to have people see that same vision and then move them out of their resting state into an elevated emotion. And then when they do that properly, those people can see that vision. If you can't change a person's energy, uh, they'll never see that vision because they'll be viewing the future Uh, through the lens of the past, the emotions of the past. And so great leaders have the ability to to have people begin to see the same vision. How does the person become the person they are and why do they keep their health condition the same? And well, most people, your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced to this moment. So most people wake up in the morning. If you think that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, they start thinking (laughs) about their problems and those problems are just memories that are etched in their brain that are connected to certain people and objects and certain things at certain times and places. And the moment they start thinking about their problems, they're thinking in the past. Now, because every one of those problems has an emotion associated with them, 
the moment they start feeling unhappy or feeling sad, now their body's in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body and how we think and how we feel creates our state of being now. The problem is, is that the person thinks of the problem, feels the emotion, and that is a thought and feeling. That's an image and an emotion. It's a stimulus and response. Yeah. And that starts the conditioning yeah. process to get the mm. body emotionally conditioned into the past. Now, here's the crazy part about yes. that. Right. The familiar past emotionally is producing dramatic effects on the body because the body is so objective that it does not know the difference between the real life experience that's creating that emotion and the emotion that person is fabricating by thought or memory alone. The body's believing it's living in the same past experience yeah. <laughs> seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the problem with that is, is that the environment signals the gene. That's epigenetics. Yeah. And the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion. So the person is yeah. keeping the same gene regulated because the body's believing it's living in the same environmental condition. So getting that person to step outside of that familiar known territory into the unknown <laughs> where there is uncertainty and have them be comfortable there and begin to think about how they are going to think. The new model of reality is about causing an effect. That means then you have to feel gratitude every day for your new experience to occur. You can't wait for your success to feel empowered. You have to be empowered to create the success. And when you teach people how to do this, and they move into a new state of being, they begin to create the life that they want. How many people are still with me? But to the materialists, they would say, well, no, 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 no. I'm going to wait for my money to come, and then I'm going to give thanks. And those people pretty much are living by the emotions of the past. And if you're living by the emotions of the past, you are viewing your future through the lens of the past and your vision will fade. Because when you bring up an elevated emotion, you will see the vision clearly. And leaders in history that changed the world knew how to change a culture. Look at Martin Luther King. He talked about justice and then got enough people inspired that they felt empowered enough to do something about it. People came out of the resting state. And so then you share the same brain as Martin Luther King. And being defined by a vision of the future begins to change a culture. But most people have the same thoughts or the same intentions and they live by the same familiar emotions and for the most part they're in their past. Well, the brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of your environment. So it begs the question, does the environment control your thinking? Or does your thinking control the environment? So if you wake up every morning and you do the same things and you go to the same places and you see the same people and you react in the same way and you perform the same behaviors, it really is the external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain causing you to think equal to everything that you know. And as long as you keep thinking equal to everything you know that's familiar and the same, according to the quantum model, you keep creating more of the same. To change then is to think greater than our environment, to think greater than the conditions in our world. The hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. When you decide to make a different choice, whether it's to change a, something that you eat or to exercise or to no longer react to certain people or conditions in your life, remember, you're going to feel uncomfortable. Now, that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. That means you're in the unknown. And when you step into the unknown, you're going through dramatic changes in your own personal biology. When you're in that place of uncertainty, that place of unpredictability, that void, that unknown, ask yourself, what thoughts do you want to believe in and fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors would you like to demonstrate that's equal to a vision of the future? Close your eyes and rehearse them. Review every step. No different than an athlete beginning to rehearse what they're about to do. The act of rehearsing it begins to prime your brain to prepare you for that behavior in your future. And then finally, can you teach your body emotionally what that future is going to feel like before it happens? 
And when you begin to fall into the present moment and marry those intentions with an elevated emotion, your body is believing it's living in that future reality in the present moment, and you're changing your biology from living in your past present reality to living in your future present reality. And your job then is to be able to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day. And if you can, get ready because something unusual is going to happen in your life. It's the law. If you think about gratitude, when, when you receive something favorable or you just receive something favorable, if something's happening to you or something just happened to you that you are excited about, um, you feel grateful. So the emotional signature of gratitude means that it's already happened or something wonderful is happening to you. Now, the body is so objective that it does not know the difference between a real life experience that's creating that emotion and that emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone. So the body's believing it's living in an environmental condition that's favorable to you. And we only accept, believe, and surrender to thoughts that are equal to our emotional state. So in the state of gratitude, your body is more prone to be programmed through its autonomic nervous system into a different destiny. And the research that we've done uh, in our, in our, on our research team shows that just four days of feeling gratitude uh, can strengthen your immune system by 50% by releasing a, an immunoglobulin called immunoglobulin A, which is your body's primary defense against bacteria and viruses. It's better than any flu shot. And it's the body's natural capacity. So, so when we trade, anger and frustration and fear and anxiety and pain and suffering and guilt for an elevated emotion, the autonomic nervous system starts to regulate back into homeostasis and balance. And of course, stress is when the autonomic nervous system is knocked out of homeostasis and balance. It's dysregulation. So we teach people how to give thanks for the things that they create in their life actually before it happens. And when we do that properly, um, we start to see measurable changes in the person's body and measurable changes in their energy and ultimately measurable changes in their life. So the concept of presence is such an important concept because I think that paying attention is being present and it's a skill just like anything else. The more you practice it, the better you get at it. And I think we know when uh, people are present with us in our lives is because they're paying attention to us. And we know when they're not present with us because they're not paying attention. Well, where you place your attention is where you place your energy, bottom line. So if you're thinking about what's going to happen in the next moment or what's going to happen in a day, or you're reviewing what's something that happened three days ago, you're placing your attention in some future scenario or some past memory and we siphon energy out of the present moment, and we don't have available energy then uh, to really begin to create an outcome in our lives. But if we're truly present and we're relaxed and poised in the present moment, if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, then you have a lot of energy in the present moment to execute, a lot of energy in the present moment to make decisions. The more you do this, the more you experience those moments of flow, the synchronicities, the serendipities, the opportunities, the coincidences, because there's a lot of power in the present moment. So one of the key elements in the creative process is teaching people how to relax into the present moment. So if a person is thinking about their problems, and those problems are memories that are etched in their brain that are connected to certain people and objects and things at certain times and places, the moment they think about their problems, say first thing in the morning when they wake up, if you believe your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, and your brain is a record of the past, the moment you remember your problems, you're thinking in the past. And because every problem has an emotion associated because you experience it, the moment you feel unhappy, now your body's in the past. So thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And, and how we think and how we feel creates our state of being. So most people unconsciously start their day with their entire state of being biologically in the past. And again, the body's so objective, it doesn't know the difference between the real life experience uh, uh, and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. So that past, that familiar past is called the known. And if you wake up in the morning and you start thinking about the predictable future and the people you have to see and the places you have to go and the things you have to do in your routine predictable life, the same exact thing happens. You're, you're imagining that future scenario that's already known to you 
and you're anticipating the feeling of that outcome. So that becomes the predictable future becomes the known as well. So if the familiar past is the known and the predictable future is the known, there's only one place where the unknown exists. And that's the sweet spot of the generous present moment. And teaching people how to create from the present moment is what begins to produce the magic and the changes that take place in their lives. So in order to create a new future, to change something in your life, nothing changes in your life until you change. That's the, that's the story, right? So then the question is, okay, is in order for me to create something new, I'm going to have to combine a clear intention. That's a function of the brain and the mind. That's a, a process that you can get better at. And you got to combine that with an elevated emotion. And that means then you can't wait for your healing to feel grateful. You can't wait for your new relationship to feel love. You can't wait for your, uh, um, wealth to feel abundance you know that's that's the old model of reality of cause and effect in fact we're going to teach people actually how to feel the emotion before it happens and when you combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion that's going to require your heart to move into balance and move into order and it turns out that's a skill too that you can practice so then when you combine those two elements so that clear intention with the elevated emotion and you can sustain that for a period of time the coherence in the brain, the coherence in the heart actually act like a Wi-Fi signal. You, you're starting to put out a broadband spectrum of frequency and energy that causes you to feel connected to something. And now you're no longer trying to get something done or waiting for something in your outer world to change, to take away the emptiness or lack you're feeling because you don't have the experience yet. If people can actually feel the feelings of the emotions before the experience happens, they wouldn't be looking for it because they would feel like it already happened, right? So we teach people how to sustain these states. And if they can, the side effect of that is that you start seeing synchronicities in your life, those serendipities, those coincidences, those opportunities that you're no longer going anywhere to get them. And you're not trying to control the outcome or force the outcome or fight for the outcome or predict the outcome or, or compete for it. That's, that's when we're matter trying to change matter. When you synchronize your energy to a possibility in your life and you start seeing those synchronicities in your life, now when you start seeing those opportunities occurring, you're just gonna start paying attention to what you've been doing and do more of it. And you go then from being the victim of your life to being the creator of your life. And the cool part about it is you don't have to go anywhere to get it. Somehow out of nowhere, it seems to come to you. And those moments are, are moments of awakening. So the formula really is about combining quantum physics with neuroscience, with neuroendocrinology, with psychoneuroimmunology, with electromagnetism, epigenetics, all of these different branches of science to build a model to show people that you actually can be the creator of your life. I travel around the world and I have the opportunity to talk to all kinds of people. And one of the things that independent of people's beliefs, political beliefs, religious beliefs, whatever, there seems to be a common thread that people feel like something's not right. And I think when um, you get to a point where you realize that no healthcare plan, no government, no religion is going to take care of you, uh, then who is going to take care of you? And the answer is you, right? So my interest is uh, to give people the tools uh, and the understanding that uh, they could heal their body, that they could create a better life for themselves, that they could overcome past traumas and scars that were created even as early as childhood that tend to be unconscious programs that keep them repeating the same you know, scenarios in their life, uh, to teach people how to induce mystical experiences so that it changes the frame of way, the way they look at reality. And so what an amazing time in history to be alive because consciousness is awareness and awareness is paying attention and paying attention is noticing. So, so if a person uh, lives a life as an example and is diagnosed with a health condition, they're, what they're conscious of is just a certain number of choices that they could make based on the past, yeah. based on tradition, based on what's worked for normal or natural. But what happens when that person has done the chemotherapy, has done the surgery, 
has done the radiation, has done the vegan diet, has done the gluten-free diet, has done the ketogenic diet, uh, has done all the things, all the exercise, and they still have the same health condition. Uh, it, it begs the question, uh, if our personality creates our personal reality, and our personality is made up of how we think, how we act, and how we feel, then the present personality who's listening to this podcast has created the present personal reality called their life. Not their ex, not their parents, not their culture. They create their life. So the fundamental question is, if, if, if I want to change my life, then that means that I have to change or nothing changes in my life until I change, right? So the person who's done all these treatments and still faced with a health condition, this is just an example, all of a sudden says, there's got to be another way. There's got to be something else. And so knowledge, information, when we learn knowledge, when we learn information, we make new connections in our brain. That's what learning is. We're forging synaptic connections. But that philosophical, theoretical, intellectual information is void of experience. Mm. Someone who takes that knowledge and applies it and personalizes, demonstrates it, initiates that knowledge, is now interested in the truth of the experience of that information. So the person then who becomes conscious that they could actually heal themselves by changing the way they think, the way they act, the way they feel, if I truly go into the experiment of no longer thinking the same way, no longer acting the same way, no longer feeling the same way, and I start thinking about what thoughts I do want to fire and wire in my brain, and if I do it with intention and attention, I'll begin to install neurological hardware, keep doing it, and it becomes like a software program. It becomes a new voice in your head that goes from I can't to I can. No magic there. If you said, how would greatness live today? Well, how, what would love look like today? What would be a greater expression of myself in the things that I do? Turns out if you close your eyes and you rehearse in your mind how you're going to be in any aspect of your day, if you're truly present, the brain doesn't know the difference between the inward experience of what you're imagining and the outer real experience. It look, the brain looks like you've already done it. The brain looks like it's already experienced it. Now, do that enough times, the hardware becomes a software program and you start behaving like a different person. And super athletes do this, this all the time. This is musicians, athletes, dancers, everybody who's good at something is always rehearsing in their mind. That, that rehearsal is just as important as the physical demonstration. It's priming the brain because the brain is a record of the past. Now you're actually making it a map to the future. You're installing circuits to use. If you said, God, I lived my whole life in guilt. I didn't know it was guilt, uh, in shame or unworthiness and self-doubt, insecurity, fear. And all of a sudden, you're looking at that emotion. You understand that emotion is actually down-regulating genes and creating disease. You figured that out. You read about it. It makes sense. Then all of the hatred, all the anger, all the bitterness you have to someone or something in your past is keeping you connected to the past. So you'd say, can I teach my body emotionally? what a new future could feel like before it happens. Not waiting for your wealth to feel abundance or waiting for your relationship to feel love or waiting for your healing to feel gratitude. Mm. That's the old model of reality of cause and effect. This is about causing an effect. Turns out if you can elevate your emotional state and you can sustain that emotional state, your body's so objective that it doesn't know the difference between the real life experience that's creating that emotion and that emotion that you're creating by thought alone, your body's actually believing it's living in a new reality, a new environment. Now, the environment signals the gene, the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion. That person is actually signaling genes ahead of the environment. Genes make proteins and proteins are responsible for the structure and function of the body. The expression of proteins is the expression of life. Okay. Every day the person practices going from the old self to the new self. This is what's happening in the world right now. As they start to change and they start unfiring and unwiring and they stop conditioning the body emotionally to the past and practice this, they emerge as a new personality. They become somebody else. And like magic, the disease exists in the old person 
and there's somebody else. Now, here's where consciousness comes in. <clears throat> that person comes to a, a workshop and they stand on the stage in front of 1500 people and they tell their story. And everybody in that audience is leaning in. Why? Because they're looking at truth. They're looking at the example. Someone who just got healed from a chronic... Uh... A chronic health. I'm talking about stage four cancers. I'm talking about Parkinson's disease. I'm talking about rare genetic disorders. And now the person in the audience is becoming conscious of a possibility that they were once unconscious to. And when they see that's possible, it's a four minute mile. I mean, four minute mile, nobody thought anybody could break a mile in under four minutes. They said it was biologically and phys yeah, physiologically impossible. 1400 people have done it already. So like, this is the four minute mile. Someone's piercing through a limitation, a level of unconsciousness. And now that's a footprint in the quantum field. But in three dimensional reality, you're looking at that person. They look no different than anybody else. And the person says, if that person can do it, I can do it as well. I think the ego is something that is healthy when it's in balance. Like if I have a bonfire in my backyard and those and the flames are getting a little bit too big and there's ashes and sparks flying off the bonfire, your ego says, David, step back. You know, it's it's preservational, it wants to take care of the body. If we're hiking on a cliff and we come to a very narrow path and it's a thousand foot drop, your ego is going to say, stay close to the wall. Don't go out to the edge. You could be injured and be hurt. So the ego has a function to really, in, in a sense, be analytical and, and weigh what we know against what we don't know. And it's healthy. The problem is, is when it's driven by the hormones of stress and stress is when your body is knocked out of balance. It's knocked out, knocked out of order. That state actually causes you to be altered. And there'll always be a gap between the way things appear or the way you appear and the way things really are. You're in an altered state. Now for the short term, that's great. All organisms can tolerate that. But if you keep doing that for an extended period of time, the arousal that's created from the stress hormones actually causes the analytical mind all of a sudden to go into overdrive. So now the endorsement of the ego becomes enhanced and we become selfish. That's what it does. It causes, it causes us to be self-indulgent, to be self-centered, to be self-important, to be self-aggrandizing, to be full of self-pity because in stress, there's only one thing that's important when you're in survival. And that's you. <laughs> and so all of our attention goes on our body. All of our attention goes on all the elements in our environment. And we come, become very preoccupied with time. Now, when we're in balance and there's order in the autonomic nervous system, there's health. And if stress is when you move out of balance, autonomic dysregulation, then you are altered from wholeness. You are, you are separate from uh, everyone and everything in your life and you tend to trust less. It's not a time to open your heart in the jungle. The survival gene is switched on. You, you don't communicate very well. You're looking at how you can get to where you need to be or accomplish what you need to do first. And you got to be there first and compete because this is all driven by those stress hormones. So the ego becomes out of balance. Now, here's the cool part about all of this. When people are driven by those stress hormones and they don't know how to change it, they don't know how to self-regulate. Again, it's not that you react. The question is, how long are you going to react? If they don't know how to do that, the problem with most people is they start analyzing their life within the emotion that's disturbing them. Now, emotions are a record of the past. So what we see on brain scans over and over again when you start overanalyzing and overthinking in a selfish way, 100% of the time, you'll make your brain worse. And that will have dramatic effects on your body. So when the heart is racing because it's pumping blood, but you're sitting in a Zoom call and you're smiling and you're looking at that person in a Zoom call and you're thinking about ways to murder them, you're, you're producing those chemicals, but you're not running and you're not fighting and you're not hiding. So what happens is the heart is pumping against a very closed system and it moves out of order, it moves out of balance. And now the autonomic nervous system, which controls and coordinates all other systems in your body is out of balance and that dysregulation causes disease. So then the fundamental question is, okay, can I trade fear 
Can I trade anger? Can I trade competition? Can I trade frustration, resentment, impatience, hostility, uh, hopelessness, powerlessness, whatever, anxiety for an elevated emotion? Can I learn how to dial down those stress hormones and practice feeling elevated emotions? Turns out you can do that. Now, the real question is when you're in your heart, you're not so selfish. In fact, when there's a change in blood flow to the heart and oxytocin and nitric oxide is released. You tend to want to give you, you tend to want to consider the whole and you lead with your heart. You're not separate from anybody. You're, you're functioning as a community. So I think then that, um, our future as, as human beings is that we have to be able to live in, a, in an elevated state in our hearts. And if we fall from grace back into those survival emotions, the key is to be able to self-regulate and get so good at it in your meditation with your eyes closed, so good at it that you can do it with your eyes open. Now that's when the game becomes really, really important. So uh, when people do the work and they do their meditations and they come up against themselves, gosh, I want them to. I want them to come up against their fear in, in the, in the week-long workshops. I want them to come up against their impatience. I want all those thoughts that come up that say, I can't, it's too hard, I'll never change, it's my ex's fault, it's my boss's fault. I want those thoughts to be right in their face. And I want to give them tools to let them know that right on the other side of that, that thought, right on the other side of that propensity to want to get up and quit, right on the other side of that emotion that's keeping them connected to the past, if they're willing to sit in the fire, to sit with themselves and instead of getting up and quitting on themselves, learn how to self-regulate and create brain and heart coherence. I guarantee you every time they go a little further uh, and they produce those victories, uh, those victories add up. So what's the side effect of that? You return back to your life and you don't need jerk as much. Why? Because you just overcame some part of your aggression and anger by sitting with your body and like training an animal, training a dog, I don't know, training uh, the servant to be present, to, 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 to be greater than the body as the mind, to execute a will that's greater than those unconscious programs. And what we found out is when people actually apply some type of formula to be able to do this, every time they bring the body back into the present moment, it starts liberating energy. So there it goes, the frustration, there it goes the impatience. And all of a sudden, the unknown, which tends to be such a scary place for most people is the present moment you see the side effect of that is the person's more present they're less preoccupied with all the things that people spend most of their attention on now so you overcome the ego you overcome the personality uh uh there's nothing wrong with it it's just you got to be able to lay it down and as you temper your body and your mind um the ego tends to be less selfish and more selfless and then the side effect of that is that then if I say, hey, look at David, he's actually doing it. I'm going to try it, too, because he's he's doing it. And research in neuroscience says you hang out with people that do things. You start your brain synchronizes and you start doing those same things. It's called an emergence emergence. That's the birds all moving in the same direction. It's a, a school of fish moving as one mind and one heart. If you study that, you think there's one leader like that. Everybody's following a leader like a top-down phenomenon. It's actually wrong. It's a bottom-up phenomenon. Everybody's leading. So the way we change the world then is that you work on yourself. I'll work on myself. We get to show up and bring our best. And when we're not at our best, we excuse ourselves, get back to that state, and we present ourselves back to the world. And I think this is such a great time in history where people really need some tools to be able to cope with, uh, with all the challenges in the world. I think there's this feeling um, that we all have uh, that uh, never seems to go away. And it's an intuition, it's an instinct that tells us that there's more to reality uh, than this dream. Uh, and, and I think that uh, people come to this work for that feeling. And I think that we're greater than we think, more powerful than we know, more unlimited uh, than we could ever dream. And my passion, my interest is to take science and combine quantum physics with neuroscience, with neuroendocrinology, with psychoneuroimmunology, with uh, the, the uh, epigenetics, electromagnetism. And I think science is that language to demystify the mystical. 
and to build models of understanding from a theoretical and intellectual um, knowledge-based uh, analytical perspective. But that knowledge void of experience is philosophy. But if you can teach people how to practically apply it, to, to personalize it, to demonstrate it, to initiate that knowledge and do something with it, if they can get their behaviors to match their intentions or their actions equal to their thoughts, if they get their mind and body working together, they're going to have an experience, right? And it turns out that learning information makes connections in the brain, but experience enriches those connections. Well, the moment those neurons string into place, there's a biological change that takes place in the brain. Another part of the brain makes a chemical, and that chemical is called an emotion. And the moment you feel successful, the moment you feel empowered, the moment you feel unlimited, I think now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. So knowledge is for the mind and experiences for the body. And so what we learned in this whole process of transformation is that the more people understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, the how gets easier. So when the experience then is causes them to embody the truth of that philosophy, it's no longer theoretical, it's experiential and it's visceral. So the experience then produces a strong emotion and the emotion then is what is the information coming uh, back to the body that begins to select and instruct new genes. And we've measured this on people that they could actually change their gene expression in, in three or four days by doing this. Now, if you've done it once, it means you gotta be able to do it again, right? So anybody who's serious about their own personal growth and evolution, the replication of any experience will begin to both neurologically and chemically condition the mind and body to work as one. So when you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it better than your conscious mind, now it's innate in you, it's implicit, it's automatic, it's second nature, it's easy. You've become the knowledge. And in a sense, you've mastered that knowledge and you're in a new state of being. So my interest is demystify that process so that people have within their reach all the tools to begin to apply it to their lives. We may not be able to control everything in our outer world, right. but we certainly can control our inner world. And so it's not so important to not react. I mean, everybody reacts, I react. The question is, how long are you gonna react? So if you keep an emotional reaction going on for an extended period of time, you're memorizing that emotion and your body as the unconscious mind is believing it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The body uh, doesn't know the difference between the real experience that produces the emotion and the emotion that we create by thought alone. So then the emotion then reaffirms the state and then people start to use the problems and the conditions in their life to keep that emotion going and I would call that an addiction. So mm. we become addicted to the very life we don't even like. So it's important then for people to realize then when you have that moment where you have crisis or something breaks down that you do have control over it and it's a formula and it's a skill and our research shows that you can teach people how to do that. And so then when you're living by some emotion, there'll always be a gap between the way things appear and the way things really are. Emotions alter our perception. And if you act during that time, you'll always say the same thing. I should have never said that. I should have never done that. I should have mm -hmm. never thought that. I should have never sent that email. So then shortening your emotional reactions is a level of intelligence then that causes you then to recalibrate because most people don't think they have control over that. They'll say, that person did it to me. That right. circumstance is the reason I am this way. Then I would say, if something in your outer environment is controlling your thoughts and feelings, then you're a victim to your environment. Yeah. And yet, how you think and feel creates your outer world. So if you're thinking and feeling equal to everything that's known in your present personal reality, you keep creating more of the same. So to change then, is to think and feel greater than the conditions in your environment. And to be able to do that to such a degree then, you're no longer reacting to the same people in the same way. And that takes an effort. It's, and it's not easy in the beginning. But once you start practicing, uh, you get better at it. And just like anything else, you start to move through your life with more coherence and you're less likely to knee jerk 
And if you're less likely to knee jerk, then you're not in an unconscious program. I think one of the most important things when we lose sight of our vision is to make time for ourselves. And I think that when you invest in yourself, you invest in your future. Disconnecting from people in your life and places that you have to go and things that you do or things that you own long enough to begin to reignite a vision of how you see yourself or how you see your future and begin to emotionally embrace that future and change your state of being allows us to see a whole new landscape. If you've lost sight of your vision, take a moment and remember that vision and begin to emotionally embrace it. And from that state of being, start to think about the things you want to do, the choices you want to make. So write them down. Review the behaviors that you have to demonstrate, your goals and experiences and how it's going to feel. When you do that enough times, you're changing your brain neurologically and you're changing your body genetically. Write down the unconscious thoughts that you have to stay conscious of. Become aware of the choices that you no longer need to make. Review the behaviors and habits you have to change about yourself and become so conscious of them that you won't go unconscious at all during your day. Remember the experiences in your environment that you need to stay away from, whether it's a person or a thing, just for a period of time so that you can keep that vision alive. And most importantly, review those emotions that keep you connected to the past and become so conscious of them and name them when you feel that feeling that if it's guilt or sadness or pain, the moment you start feeling it and you become conscious of it, that's when you can begin to change. And if you keep doing this over and over again, the unlearning and the relearning, the breaking the habit of the old self and reinventing a new self is going to cause you to arrive at a whole new future. And when you do, this could become your new habit. You can't go to the future holding on to the biology of your past. Decide what thoughts you can bring to your future. Write them down. Thoughts like, I can't. It's too hard. I'll never change. I'll start tomorrow. What's wrong with me? It's someone else's fault. Decide on what behaviors or actions or unconscious habits you have to change. How do you talk? Do you complain? Do you blame? Do you make excuses? Do you feel sorry for yourself? Just become so conscious of those behaviors that you'll never go unconscious again. And lastly, you have to decide what emotions no longer belong in your future. That means if you want to be wealthy, you can't take lack. If you want to be healthy, you can't take insecurity or fear. You got to begin to condition your body to a new mind. If you do this every single day, your personality creates your personal reality. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. Change any one of those things and you change your life and begin to measure the effects of you at cause. Give it a shot. Your personality creates your personal reality. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's listening to this little video has created the present personal reality called your life. Which means then, if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, you would have to change your personality. That means you'd have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. It means you'd have to become aware of your unconscious habits and behaviors and modify them. And you'd have to look at certain emotions that keep you connected to experiences in the past and decide, do these emotions belong in your future? The beauty behind this is, is that when you begin to change how you think, how you act, and how you feel, you should begin to see changes in your life. And I recommend that you try it out. Love inspires us. It inspires us to give. It inspires us to express. It inspires us to serve, to care for one another, to be kind to one another, uh, to listen with compassion and understanding. And love actually causes us to create. We become creative in that state. And you've heard me say that when there is a change in energy, there is a change in your life. And an inspiration is a change in energy. And if you don't change your energy, if you stay in the same energy, then it makes sense that your life stays the same. So if you can become inspired and raise your energy, you become aware of things that you were once unaware of. Why? Because 
energy causes us to become conscious of things we were once unconscious to. In other words, you change your frequency, you have more access to information. And that's the name of the game here. So if you stay at the same level of energy uh, every single day, then you will be unaware of possibilities. So you'll, you'll not be able to create anything new. So you can't see any possibilities, again, from the same energy. In order for you to become inspired by love, inspired by energy, you'll become conscious of possibilities that you were once unconscious of. Now, energy or energy in motion, uh, they are emotions. And so if we live by the same emotions every single day, and we haven't changed who we are, and there's a movement happening, or you're in the creative state, and you stay in the same feelings and the same familiar emotions, then you can't see any possibilities because you're looking through the lens of some past experience, and you can only see the same. So then, inspiration then, the word inspiration means the movement of energy. Inspiration to inspire in spirit. It is becoming more energy and less matter. The majority of our thoughts and feelings mm -hmm. are connected to our sexuality, to our victimization, our guilt, our suffering, our shame, our unworthiness, our self-doubt, or our importance, our control, our fear, our anger, our frustration, our hatred, our judgment, those are, those are the first three hormonal centers in the body. And, and those first three centers have everything to do with survival. Mm. And those centers are energy consumers. Uh, orgasm, digestion, <sighs> stress is a lot of energy that, that yes. we're drawing from our very vital life force, yes. our resource of light and information, and we're turning it into chemistry, and we're literally robbing the body's energy, right? So, so then living like that for the short term is okay, because the body can move back to homeostasis, it mm -hmm. can restore itself, but when we're overdoing that consistently, yeah. then there's no energy for growth and repair, because you're living constantly in survival. So. Again, you can eat all the right food, you can do all the right things, but if you're living in anxiety and fear and you're viewing your world from the worst case scenario that could possibly happen, because that's what you do in survival, there's no energy for growth and repair. There's no energy for healing. So the majority of our thoughts are signaling certain circuits in the brain that signal another part of the brain, the limbic brain, to make what's called a neuropeptide. Mm. Neuropeptides are chemical messengers that signal hormonal centers. Mm. So now you're taking thought mm -hmm. and you're storing it as energy in these energy centers. And, and if you're living in survival, why would you open your heart? I mean, it's just not a time to open your heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're getting chased by T-Rex, mm -hmm. it's not a time to meditate. It's not a time to learn. It's not a time to connect. It's not a time to communicate. It's not a time to sit down and go within. It's not a time to be vulnerable. It's time to run, fight, or hide. To change is to be greater than your environment. That means to be greater than the conditions in your life, to be greater than the circumstances in your world. And every great person in history knew this. That means you have to be defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past. To change means to be greater than your body those unconscious habits and behaviors and choices that you've made over and over again so many times that the body becomes the mind. Emotions that are connected to past experiences keep you anchored emotionally to the past and if those emotions are driving your thoughts and those thoughts are creating the same emotions then your body has become the mind which means that in order for you to change you're gonna have to get greater than those emotional reactions, habits and hardwired attitudes that keep you running unconscious programs. And to change then is to be greater than time. If you're waking up every single day and making the same choices and demonstrating the same behaviors and creating the same experiences and you do that over and over again, it makes sense that your past is gonna look a lot like your future and your future will be more of your past. Finding the sweet spot of the generous present moment, existing in that place where you're no longer trying to predict the future based on the past means you're in the unknown. And when you're in that place called the eternal present moment, that's where all possibilities exist. Give it a try. If your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel, and it is, yes or no, and 
you stop thinking the same way and nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together, every place where one neuron connects with another neuron is called the memory. So as you begin to unfire and unwire, you prune the very circuits in your brain that are connected to the old self. And the memory of the old self begins to mutate, begins to change. So then you would say, where is that memory stored? And it's stored in the soul now as wisdom because you're no longer that person, yes or no? And if you could no longer behave the same way and nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together, and pruning is part of biology, you don't use it, you lose it, then your memory of the old self would begin to change. And that is a biological death in the beginning that is uncomfortable for a lot of people. If you're no longer feeling the same emotions that keep you connected to the past and you keep inhibiting that process, the body will be craving the chemicals in the beginning because it's been conditioned that way. It's been, it's been addicted. It's the mind. And it's anticipating events and the emotions from those events and you're putting the brakes on. And that's uncomfortable. And you got to stay conscious and it takes an enormous amount of energy. And you're no longer signaling the same genes and producing the same hormones. And your body is no longer being influenced by your mind in the same way. And sometimes the mind is the biggest enemy to the body. And you're inhibiting that process. And the body, which has become the mind, wants its way. And it's uncomfortable to change. And you've got to be able to be greater than that to truly change. And everybody that's changed has come up against that feeling. And they almost make the same choice and they don't. And they're so glad that they didn't. And it takes an enormous amount of energy and awareness to do that. So as the old self deconstructs because you have the free will to decide who you want to be on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and if your life isn't changing and you want to change your life, you got to change. And now you are playing the game and you are now saying this personality, this person that I've become, I'm in the habit of being it and I want to become somebody else. And the more you learn about love, the more you learn about life, the more you learn about possibility and potential, the more you become aware of it, there are more possibilities, and knowledge is the thing that gives us that. And so the old self is a memory like another lifetime. Like, you can remember it, but you're no longer interested in it any longer because it no longer defines you. How many people understand what I'm talking about? So then the biological death of the old self is crossing a river of change and you got to stay with it long enough to become somebody else and you think it's about wealth it's you think it's about health it's about who you become <laughs> the people who become somebody else they they see dramatic changes in their health and in their lives and and they can't find the words to be able to explain it but it's practical though if you truly want to change your life, you have to change yourself. You would have to be conscious of your thoughts and aware of your actions and, and familiar with those emotions. And you would never fall from grace. And if you did, you would stop and self-correct. If you truly were interested in evolution, and if you said to me, it's, I, can't, I lost it because of that person, I'd say to you, you're back to the unconscious program of allowing your environment to control how you feel and think. You got two choices. Stay there for another six hours or pause and change your energy. <laughs> change your energy and get back to the emotions of your future and the feelings of your future. It's a much better place to be. Reason this with me. You could have a great meditation and condition your body just like you did into the future. You come back to your senses and you return back to the same old self, romance in the past again. You're going to weigh that one 50 minute, one hour meditation against the rest of the day back to you you got to start practicing. We have to start doing it with our eyes open. And the thought of who we want to become should produce the feeling of it instantaneously. In other words, the thought of your future should produce the feeling that it already happened instead of the feeling of lack because it hasn't happened. How many people understand that? And the people who do this well, they condition their body into the future. And they say, I don't know how it happened. It's like I, my body was led right to the event. And your body's going to follow your mind to an unknown, just like it follows your mind to the toilet every morning. But instead of it being the known, it's going to be the unknown. That's where your attention and your energy has been. 
And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what you believe in. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, what you eat. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I've seen it in all ways. So then the thought of our future if we're doing this properly, should produce the feeling that it already happened. If the thought of your future produces the lack that it hasn't happened, you're still in your past and nothing is going to change. And it would make sense then that you would want to get that heart open on a regular basis so that you can feel the emotions of your future before it happens. I'm telling you, there's a lot of biology that changes in you. And you do it enough times, you, you become that person. The thought of it then produces the feeling that it's already happened. That's how you know you're getting close, independent of what's going on in your life. That's when you're mastering yourself and mastering your life. I have sat in meditations and out of nowhere I had the most icky, so familiar but so foreign feeling move through me that it was, I don't know, I never saw it coming. I didn't know what it was. And all I did was instead of run and turn on my cell phone or lay down or quit, I was curious if there was something on the other side of it. So if I stayed present with it and felt it, it was an energy and that energy is a frequency and that frequency carries information or the emotion as a memory, however you want to say it. And so you have to pass through the valley of the shadow of darkness many times to find the light. And I have sat with my body curious to wonder if there's anything on the other side of this emotion. And if I stayed present with it and felt it, it would turn into something else in time. And so then think about it. You know, we have different sensations that our body experiences. You may feel like a tightening in your throat and your respiratory rate going up and kind of flush and your heart uh, uh, fluttering and you may be feeling anxious, but all of those sensations that the body is recording, your interpretation of it is anxiety or being anxious. So the sensations then, the cumulative sensations, as information, we call it an emotion. So the moment we name it, it's anxiety, but those sensations that come up for the body is information. So people then sitting in the presence of that information and allowing you to experience it fully will cause you to move through it. Now for me, I'm all about this. If it's, familiar, if it's a familiar feeling, more than likely I'm back in some unconscious program because the emotion is driving certain behaviors, certain habits, certain thoughts. Now that doesn't mean that people can't go through grieving processes, but I do believe that that process for some people becomes a way for them to get attention and to get things in their life that they need and they use it in a way that becomes part of their identity and they do that unconsciously. And so for me, I would say then what greater piece of knowledge could I learn about grief or about myself that I would want to apply to evolve my experience of it and see if there's something on the other side of it. So we look for those answers then and we build a model. And for example, people uh, grieve a lot for, for people that die. And I totally get it. But if you had a greater understanding of death, you may not have a, a grief for that long because you would say, my goodness, if I truly love this person, if you passed this plane and you saw someone you loved walking around suffering, what would you say to them after a period of time? Hey, if you love me, live your life. I'm on. I'm going on. Go. Enjoy. So I always look, what is my limited belief about, about something and could I learn to, to expand my awareness of what's possible? So if you feel the grief, stay present with it and see by staying present with it, if there's something on the other side of it, sit with it long enough. I, I have, I've had so many dark nights. I've sat with it until it turned into something else. I just, I just was curious. I didn't want anything out there to do it. I wanted to do it. And when it matters the most is when it's the hardest. That's what I know. What's emerging in the world now because of information, information is teaching people that there are other possibilities that they were unconscious to. And you don't need an authority any longer. You don't need a priest. You don't need a governor. You don't need a teacher. You don't need a doctor to gain information any longer. Information is available. But the question is, what will you do with it? 
So if you give people sound scientific information, and science is the language of mysticism, and you combine quantum physics with neuroscience and neuroendocrinology and psychoneuroimmunology and epigenetics and electromagnetism, and make it simple, and don't talk about tradition or religion or culture, that's gonna divide an audience, but bring the model of science in. If that person can reason and understand what they're doing with that information and why they're doing it, then the side effect of how they're doing it is gonna get easier. And now the application becomes essential. So what we're seeing is this emergent consciousness where people are taking their power back and not relying on anyone or anything for their own personal change or transformation. And I think that when you get enough people doing it, emergence in biology is a, a group of birds all moving in the same direction of, of a school of fish all moving. The appearance is a larger organism. They're behaving in the exact same way. There's no leader. When you study that in biology, everybody's leading. So how are we going to change the world? It's not one person, not one consciousness. It's a collective consciousness. And the research says that collective networks of observers determine reality. Yet enough people believing in possibility, sooner or later, someone's going to run into that experience. And you need one. And once you know it's possible, then other people will start doing it as well, just like the four minute mile. So, so in the world right now, I think we're seeing a breaking down of so many conventions, whether it's religion or medicine or the environment or journalism. Everything's falling apart right now because it can't sustain itself because no organisms in nature live in this kind of abusive competition. We, or, organisms survive in cooperation and connection and communion. Keep people in fear, keep them angry, keep them in pain, keep them all, well, all those survival emotions, you'll never have community. You bring people into an elevated emotional state, something innate in the human species says, we're, em we're empathic to one another, we celebrate one another, we want to get along with one another, we want to cooperate, we want to resolve issues together. That's, that's who we are uh, yeah. when we're not living in stress and survival. So think about this. If you spend the majority of your day focusing on matter, focusing on everything in this three-dimensional world that's made of material things, it begs the question, how much of your time and your attention do you put on that unified field, that invisible field of information that exists beyond space and time? And just like when you're unaware of your nose, it doesn't exist, and the moment you become aware of it, it exists, the quantum field is exactly the same way. If you put very little attention on it in your waking day, then it doesn't exist for you. But the moment you begin to become aware of it, the moment you begin to pay attention to it, the moment you begin to stay present with it and to experience it moment after moment, and if where you place your attention as you learned is where you place your energy, and where you place your attention causes things to expand, the moment you begin to experience it, not with your senses, you experience this three-dimensional reality with your senses, but you experience it with your consciousness and with your awareness. The moment you become pure consciousness is the moment you make contact with that unified field. And so we now know the techniques and the tools to get people beyond themselves. And in fact, we know that after thousands and thousands and thousands of brain scans, that you're at your absolute best when you get beyond yourself. When you take your attention off your body, when you take your attention off your identity that's connected to people in your life, the things you own, objects you own, places you have to go in time itself, the moment you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, that is the moment you become pure consciousness. And that's the moment you begin to connect to that field of possibilities called the unified field or the quantum field. And that field is an invisible field of information that exists beyond this space and time. And independent of the color of your skin, your gender, your diet, your sexual preference, independent of your profession, your class, independent of all those things that create separation, that every human being has access to it. I always tell my advancing students, you know when you're changing? is when you stop talking about it. Because when you are truly changing, you can't 
go to church and shake hands and say peace be with you and then get in your car and cut everybody off on the way out of the parking lot. You can't say I don't like the war in Iraq and be arguing with your next door neighbor or your coworker. <laughs> you have to be the living example of everything you want to see in the world in terms of change. If you don't like greed, start giving. You know, you have to demonstrate it and when you do, you give people permission to do the same because they're going to observe you doing exactly what they're afraid to do but they know it's the right thing to do. So the way we transform the world is we transform ourselves. The way you transform a culture is you transform an individual. And individual by individual, when we stop looking outside of us and we say, that world is a reflection of some aspect of me, if everybody in the world did that simultaneously, imagine how the world would change. And it's not enough to just focus on peace. Yeah, there's been great studies that have shown that when a community of people focus on peace that the crime rates drop. But when they leave and the research is over, the crime rates return back to the ceiling value. It's not enough to just think it, you gotta demonstrate it. You gotta show it in all areas of your life. And when you demonstrate it now, it becomes an example for people to follow. Let's say you've had some pretty rough experiences in your past. And those experiences caused you to feel sad and unworthy and guilty and judgmental. And you've gotten so used to feeling guilty and unworthy and judgmental that that just feels normal to you. And then because you feel kind of victimized, then you blame people and you complain and you make excuses and you feel sorry for yourself. And that's your personality. And all of a sudden you say, today, I'm not going to do that any longer because that's the old self. And then you start off your day and it goes really well for about two hours. And then all of a sudden, the moment you realize that you're no longer making the same choices as the day before, you are going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. It's going to be uncertain. There's going to be some unpredictability. And we now know that people would rather hold on to their guilt and unworthiness than to step into the unknown because at least they can feel something. And so the moment you stop making the same choices that you always make, get ready because it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's the moment you are heading towards the new self. And we call it stepping into the river of change. But now, remember, 95% of who you are is your body as the mind. You know, you've done something enough times that your body does it better than your brain. So you may actually complain unconsciously because your body does it all the time. And all of a sudden you say, no complaining, no more blaming, no more feeling sorry for myself, no more talking about other people, I'm going to stop. You know what happens, don't you? The body starts sending signals to the brain. The body's been conditioned that way. And all of a sudden, you start hearing the thoughts in your head that say, why don't you start tomorrow? Tomorrow's a better day. This is too hard for me. I can't change. Something's wrong with me. It's my mother's fault. It's my ex-husband's fault. It's my ex-wife's fault. I'm this way because of this event. Or the most important one, this doesn't feel right. And the moment you respond to that thought as if it's true, that thought leads to the same choice, which leads to the same behavior that creates the same experience, that produces the same emotion, and the person says, this feels right. That feels familiar. Going from the old self to the new self, stepping into that void, stepping into that uncertainty, is the biological, the neurological, the chemical, the hormonal genetic death of the old self. And people will say to us, well, 
in that unknown, I can't predict my life or my future. And we always say the same thing to them. The best way to predict your future is to create it, not from the known, but from the unknown. And when you and I get comfortable in the place of the unknown, that's where the magic happens. And it never happens in the known. If you have a very brain-driven person like myself, and in some parts I disconnected from my emotions just to protect me in regular life, um, and it's a challenge for me to reconnect to my old emotions that I mm. already had in circumstances that would help. Um, do you have any advice? Yeah, well, uh, God, I have a lot of advice around <laughs> that. Because um, uh, 70% of the time, uh, people in their waking lives, uh, they live in a very protective state. They live in a state of stress or in a state of survival. In fact, it's such a program that we don't know that we're doing this. We're always spanning the environment to determine if it's safe or not. And if something appears out of the predictable or unknown, it alerts us and we move into a state of arousal and we begin to turn on the very systems that begin to say danger, threat, uh, possible uh, scenario that's not uh, a safe. And when that happens, uh, we literally begin to anticipate an outcome. And when we do that, we're always preparing for what could go wrong. And we begin to create the emotions ahead of the experience of what happens if it goes wrong, whether it's fear, anxiety, uh, worry, uh, sadness, pain. We do that unconsciously. That's what a program is. And that becomes the habit. So if you're living in a world where men have to provide and show a certain amount of success and be competitive, then you're not going to open your heart. It's not a time to do that. It's a time to survive and thrive in an environment. And yet, um, in our work, I see men that if they practice yeah, opening their hearts, and it's just being a child again, being a boy again, being curious, being wondering, being free, being allowing yourself to let go. We're all faced with uh, great challenges, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And <clears throat> there's always a door. There is always a door. And so, your personality creates your personal reality. It's that simple. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's listening to this show has created the present personal reality called their life. Which means if you're going to change something in your personal reality in your life, you got to change your personality. You have to change. Nothing changes until you change. That's the bottom line. You change, but you, the thought of changing my personality seems so like, but I like who I am, kind of, but I'm also cranky. I'm also annoyed. So like, who is that person underneath all of these ailments, I guess, all of these, but it's a weird thing to say you change your personality. Well, look, I mean, I, there's many things that I love about my personality, just like you do. I'm going to take that with me. But there are things, if I'm going to be defined by a vision of the future, there are things that can't come. Because <laughs> the moment you say, I want to have a mystical experience where I transcend this three-dimensional world, and, and you want to have a, a really profound moment, a transcendental moment, you start showing up for that, and it doesn't happen right away, then what? You're going to start disbelieving? You start to stop believing in yourself? So, so the moment we're defined by a vision of the future that's bigger than us, that vision of the future is not the vision of the past. And when we do that, we take, away, we take with us our discipline, we take with our concentration, we take our presence, we take our passion, we take our strengths with us. All those things you take. But the things that are standing in the way are those old beliefs. The things that stand in the way that, 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 that stop you from connecting to it. Those are the things you come up against. And, and it's, not the, it's not the mystical experience or the transcendental experience. It's who you become. It's not your wealth. It's not your health. It's who you become. It's not your freedom. It's who you become in the process. And it's the overcoming process that we overcome, that we overcome, that we overcome, that we overcome until we finally become. And so many great people in history you know, even wealthy people, people always want to be wealthy. But if you study wealthy people that really did it, they failed miserably thousands of times until they figured it out. And so you keep showing up for yourself enough times, you're going to change. 
you're going to change. You're going to be thinking differently. You're going to be acting differently. You're going to be feeling differently. And that's when the universe starts to conspire in ways that we just never even thought about. That's, that's, that's the beauty behind creation. When a person begins to slow their brain waves down, they have to go, when you're in stress, when you're in survival, you narrow your focus on a cause. That's called a what's called a convergent focus. So now you're blessing the energy centers of the body that are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And when the autonomic nervous system moves out of balance, the brain moves out of balance, right? We narrow our focus on the cause, and it causes each one of these different energy centers to move into incoherence as well. And those little, little individual brains start moving into incoherence and send an incoherent message to the cells and tissues and organs. Hormones then become down-regulated and the body starts moving out of balance. So when we bless the energy centers or we pro reprogram these energy centers, two things has to happen. They have to be able to slow their brain waves down. They have to get out of that high beta state. And the way we do it is to go from a narrow focus to a broad focus. When you open your focus, when you open your awareness, mm -hmm. that's what creates coherence in the brain because mm -hmm. you're going against that habit of putting your attention on matter. So there's a convergent focus, which is focusing on matter, and then there's a divergent focus, which is focusing on energy. Well, reality is both particle and wave, mm -hmm. matter and energy. So if a person can slow their brain waves down from beta brain waves to alpha brain waves, now they're starting to fall out of their thinking brain mm -hmm. right into the home of the autonomic nervous system. Okay. If the person can't change their brain waves, okay. It'll never work because okay. they're in their neocortex and their thinking mind, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that has to happen. The second thing that has to happen is that they have to practice both a convergent focus and a divergent focus. Now, so by the convergent, you're focusing on, let's say I'm going to focus on this energy center, center right. right? And then you move your focus to another energy well, center. Well, first you, first you focus on that energy center, that's particle, and then you focus on the space around it, that's okay. wave. Okay. And so when you open your awareness, and you're able to do that, and you're in your autonomic nervous system, you can put an intention there, oh. which will create more balance in estrogen, more balance in uh, your, your sexual organs. You move to your second center. You put your attention there. That's your, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So now you're beginning to direct energy yeah. into that center. But now you become aware of the space around it. Why? To create coherence in that little brain. Send the coherent message to the cells and tissues. Mm. Go to your third center right in the pit of your gut. Well, there's a huge celiac plexus there, a solar plexus, a lot of connections in there. So now put your that's attention. That's a big one. That's a big Always one. Always getting a lot of signs there. Yeah. Here and here, yeah. heart and solar plexus. Yeah, that's a, those are big ones. And you tune in to that energy. Then you right. put your attention in your heart. It has its own individual brain. Yeah. And when you make energy here, when energy finally arrives here, guess where it goes automatically? Straight up, we've measured it. Mm. So now once you start opening hmm. your heart, you get more energy in your heart, you get more energy in your brain. Got it. And Short all, on time, just go straight to the heart. <laughs> that's why we do it. That's exactly why we, that's why we open the heart. So it creates a field and it begins to drive energy mm. of the brain. So now that energy is going to cause the person to have a different consciousness, a different thought pattern, right? Mm. And now they're going to be thinking possibility because in survival, the first three ones are all about survival. Uh, yeah. It's really not a creative process of creating from mind. It's more about a more primitive, you yeah. know, um, humanistic part of us, you know, animal part of us. Yeah. So then there's the thyroid plexus, the pineal gland, the pituitary gland. So we've seen when people create coherence in each one of these energy centers and they do it properly, they know how to change their brain waves. They get into the operating system. They can master convergent and divergent focus. They're no longer living just this way. They've practiced opening their awareness and focus on energy, becoming conscious of it. And as these brains become more coherent and they start producing different signals to hormones and chemicals and into different glands in the body, that's what's being upregulated to make different, different expressions. Would you say it's smart to focus on one goal? I mean, if you're sick, obviously, it's it's smart to focus on, on getting healthy but if you have a regular life and you say you know i would like to have the classical stuff more money uh, more wealth more love more joy would you say in those meditations it's smart to focus on different goals or should it rather be the big goal like a big vision i have for my life that all the steps on the way are just marks i will pass at one point well, let's answer that on two levels too, because people come to our workshops for all different reasons. Some people come because they're sick. Some people come because they want more money. Some people want more, a new job, a new opportunity, a new career, a new relationship. Some people want the mystical, 
uh, the people come for all kinds of reasons. To me, I don't care. What I care about is that they latch on to a vision and they learn how to create. Whatever drives them to that elegant moment where they're so present and so passionate about what they want and they have a clear intention, a clear vision, a coherent brain, and they have an elevated emotion combined with it that they create hard coherence. And now they're broadcasting a whole new energy into the field. And whatever we broadcast into the field is our experiment with destiny. So I want people to know the how, because we have plenty of people that have made millions and millions of dollars that were living in the backseat of their car or filed bankruptcy. We have plenty of people that were stage four cancer, serious health conditions that are healed. But really, people think they come for those reasons, but we come for wholeness. That's why we come. That when we feel so whole and so happy with ourselves, so connected to something greater, if you feel wholeness, it's impossible for you to want. How can you want when you're whole? When you're whole, you feel like you have everything. So I want people to reach that point where they feel so whole uh, that they no longer want, and that's when the magic happens. Teaching them that uh, allows them to understand that when they come back to their senses, they open their eyes. They're not looking for the experience. They feel like it's already happened. And if you feel like it's already happened, why would you be looking for it? Then, if your body is conditioned emotionally into that future, um, you're not separate from the energy of your future. You're connected from it, to it. But the moment you get in traffic and you start getting angry, uh, you get on the line at the bank and you start getting impatient, or you're sitting in a staff meeting, you start judging a coworker, you just disconnected from the energy of the future and now you're back to the energy of your past and you've done nothing wrong. You just lost your connection to the future. Now, now, the importance of that is to notice that you're disconnected. And if you say to me, well, that person made me feel this way and think this way, I'd say, oh my gosh, you're back to the unconscious program of being a victim in your life. The victim is saying that someone or something is controlling how I think and feel. But a person who's producing outcomes in their life, all of a sudden they say, wow, the way I'm thinking and feeling is creating outcomes in my life. Now I'm a creator in my life and now I believe less that I'm a victim of my life. What are a few things we can do to support our inner environment on a daily basis? Ah, well, listen, um, the first thing and the, and the most important thing for me is knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is really power and, and knowledge and information about yourself shouldn't it should empower you. It should empower the self, right? So when we learn about the immune system and all that can do, and we say, oh my God, you mean not every virus gets to me? In fact, no. And the more you, the more you understand that and the more you coax your immune system into love and into, mm. into love. Like we, well, I just did this little thing on, um, on our social media where I was talking about the inner army of order and mm. what would be the signal you would want that inner army to get. And so we created this meditation and we said, what would invincibility feel like? Signal your body and feel invincible. How would you feel if you had an uncompromising will that you had more energy than you could possibly imagine? Show your body what it feels like because it is that emotion of invincibility, that emotion of an uncompromising will to empower your inner world. And you have the intent of that's what it's for wow, get ready because you're going to start creating a cadence and a rhythm where your, your body's going, whoa, what, what, are the, what is all these new chemicals? What are all these new signals? Right. Hey, hey, it's time. Hey, hey, uh, now all of a sudden receptor sites on the T cells go, wow, we got some new signals coming from the boss here. Let's right. open up all those T cell receptors. Let, let's go. We, in fact, we're, we're, we, we would love a little fight right now because we got a lot of time on our hands and we got all our receptors turned on. <laughs> oh. I mean, that, that would be a signal for your body. We also know that if you could just trade fear and frustration and resentment and suffering uh, for an elevated emotion and truly open your heart again and practice doing that, um, you'll heal.
You'll uh, heal. You'll heal because, I mean, all healings happen in the heart. I believe in free will. Yeah. I would never tell anybody what to believe, like politically or socially or whatever. Yeah. I, I want to provide them the tools and give them the free will to create life however they want and yeah. believe whatever they want. That's totally cool with me. Mm -hmm. So those people then that want to be healed and they live in fear, mm -hmm. that fear has to be addressed. I mean, and it's not easy mm -hmm. because it's, re it's hardwired deep in the limbic brain. It's just a safety net, it's a mechanism. So then imagine being in the unknown. The, the instinct and the unknown is it's a scary place. Mm. Wow, imagine not having a body. And we practice lingering without a body in, 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 in an infinite space and not without a name, without a face, without a culture, without a job, without a social security number, without a disease, without a diet, just as an awareness. You, you practice that. You're going to be comfortable in the unknown. You're going to relax more into it. That's going against thousands of years mm. of programming. And the people who actually overcome their fear and they trade it for gratitude, their immune system gets stronger, uh, their genes upregulate. I mean, there's just a host of, uh, uh, everything changes, their brain changes, their heart rate variability. They're, they're, they feel differently and it's, yeah. it's being measured. And, and some of these people, uh, we're measuring this now in our, in our events with, with reputable scientists and in, in, in universities. They're, they're, shocked at what they're witnessing on a cellular level, on a brain level, on a heart level. They cannot believe the capacity of the body. I just, was, I just got an email today of a one of our scientists said, I ran this three times. <laughs> the virus that we exposed the cell to in advanced meditators does not enter the cell. It's outside the cell. It won't, the virus... In novice meditators, some of it's in the cell, some of it's outside. Controls all the viruses in the cell. There's an immunity. So when the person's less reactionary to their environment, there's less of response that weakens them, they're less of a victim to their environment, then they're less of a victim to their environment. Large scale, small scale, the body has a greater immunity to whatever it is. I wanna show you what it looks like when you learn something new. You have 100 billion neurons in your brain. A hundred billion neurons. The number of connections you have in one neuron is between 10,000 and 40,000 connections. If you took a hundred billion sheets of paper and you stacked them on top of each other, it would be 5,000 miles high. That's the distance from Los Angeles to London. If you took a scoop of gray matter the size of a grain of sand, you would have 100,000 neurons in it with over a billion connections. Now, I'll stop right after this slide. Learning is making new synaptic connections. Every time you learn something new, this is what's happening in your brain, geniuses. If you learned one bit of information today, your brain did this. Boom, that's learning. Physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment. Every time you learn something in your brain, there's a physical change that takes place and learning is making new connections. Are you with me? This is how fast it happens too. That's learning. If you learn anything this week, you've made a footprint. If learning is making new synaptic connections, <clears throat> then if you keep firing the same thoughts over and over again, you're gonna wire them in your brain. So then if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining them. And all of a sudden, they develop a long-term relationship. And just like any relationship, the more you communicate, the more they connect. And neurons are exactly the same way. Now, as you begin to learn information, neurons tend to assemble themselves into networks, or what's called neural networks. And neural networks are just gangs of neurons that have fired and wired together to form a community of neurosynaptic connections that's related to a thought, a skill, a habit, a behavior, a concept. 
<clears throat> and neural networks are automatic programs. You have a neural network to brush your teeth, to put on makeup, to speak a language, to walk. All of a sudden, those neurons then form a hardware circuitry, but if you keep repeating it, the hardware becomes a software program and it becomes automatic. People think that they want certain things because they're experiencing lack. And, and so they have to go about becoming the very person. So then if we reframe it and you say, oh, I really want to be wealthy, I want all my needs met, and I'll say, really, why do you want to be wealthy? And they'll say, because I want freedom. I'd say, okay, well, let's focus on freedom. So now the person understands the sponsoring thought or the emotion. Why would you wait for your wealth to feel free? That's the Newtonian model of reality of cause and effect. Waiting for someone or something out there to take away this emptiness or lack. Hmm. And what if I'm feeling this emotion? This emotion is influencing certain thoughts and how I think and feel creates my life. If I'm living in lack, I'm not going to create anything new. But if I say to you, hey, when you become that person, once you become it, then your, your reality is going to reorganize itself. Instead of living by cause and effect, let's teach you how to cause and effect. So then the person then is no longer interested in getting something in their environment when they realize it's about who they become. And all of a sudden now the emphasis or the interest is in becoming that person. And we have a week with those people and I want them to walk as it, sit as it, stand as it, lay down as it. I want them to get in the habit of walking from their room to the ballroom. It's become the new habit. That's why when we do our work, you're, we're doing sitting meditations, we're doing standing and walking meditations, we're doing lying down meditations. I want it to become a new habit. I want them to become that person. So then, this happens thousands of times. People come for certain reasons. One of my biggest problems is that I tend to react quickly to negative situations. How, how can I cope with anger? Do you have any suggestions or advice? Yeah, I'll tell you the first thing. It's not that you react. We all react. The question is, how long are you going to react? That's the question. So we found out that when people react emotionally with anger, uh, with antagonism, uh, there's an arousal that takes place because you're turning on the sympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system is a primitive system saying, Alex, whatever that, whatever that is, is a threat to you. And if there's a threat, a good way to deal with a threat is to get aggressive. That's primitive, it's animal, it's very animal. Some people will say, oh my God, there's my ex, and instead of getting angry, they run. They, 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 they flee, they're in fear. They're like, the fear is, uh, I'm better just getting away. So they, 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 the fear causes them to run. Uh, uh, so uh, when people feel fear, when they feel anger, when they feel pain, those are the primary stimulators that switch on that sympathetic nervous system. And they used to say that it's automatic. Like it's automatic, it happens automatically. That's part of the autonomic nervous system and you really don't have any control of it. Turns out that's absolutely not the truth. So first thing is learning how to shorten your response to the emotional reaction. So if you have an event that happens to your life in, in your life and I say, Alex, why are you so mad today? And you say, oh, it's because of this situation and this person, and this happened this way. And I would say, oh my gosh, are, do you mean that that person or that circumstance is controlling the way you feel and the way you think? Now, anything that's controlling the way we feel and the way we think makes us victims, hmm. whatever that is. Now, that's okay. But if you keep that emotional reaction going on for hours or days, and I say to you, Alex, it's five days, what's up? And you say to me, I'm, yeah. I'm upset from something that happened to me five days ago, I'd say you have a mood. You're in a mood. Now, some people keep that same emotional reaction going on for weeks or months. And then I would say, well, Alex has a angry, temperament it becomes a temperament 
If we keep it going for, now this is true, people keep this going for years on end. If it goes on for years, now it's a personality trait. Mm -hmm. So here's the weird right. part about it. You t ask that person who's been angry for years why they're angry. And they'll recall an event from 10 years ago or a series of events from 10 years ago. Yeah, and the childhood. Yeah, and the research on the memory says that 50% of that story isn't even the truth. They, they, they can't even remember the truth. They embellish the story and make it sound worse than it really was to excuse themselves from changing. Now, what we tell people is forget the event. Doesn't matter. The details of the event doesn't, what matters is learning how to overcome the emotion. So when you're sitting in a meditation and all of a sudden out of nowhere, your body starts getting aroused and it starts getting frustrated and it starts getting angry. And people say, I'm doing my meditation wrong. You know what I say to them? No, 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 no. You're doing it right because that has to come up. So then, so when the anger and the frustration comes up and a person's in a meditation, they have one of two choices to quit, which is what they've always done. But if you're sitting with 1500 people and no one else is quitting, you're not going to quit. And if I teach you how to lower the volume to that emotion, and I teach you a way to change that. So the future then is created by a clear intention and an elevated emotion. Now listen closely that you have to cultivate in your inner environment of thoughts and feelings. But most people, by the old self are living from past memories that are created from knowledge and experience from something that happened outside of them some experience or trauma that defined them and getting a person beyond the old self then is the great work that's what we're here for so we've studied motivation and i can tell you without a doubt that the highest form of motivation in any culture, in any group of people, is what's called purpose motivation, duty motivation, or mission motivation. You know what that is? To have a vision to change a culture that's bigger than you, to instill change in the world. Look at Elon Musk. How many people know who he is? Elon Musk, he created Tesla Motors. You know him? You know who he is? He created an electric car that can go from zero to 60 in less than five seconds. And before him, electric cars were like golf carts that cr you know, crawled along the road. And he said, I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I have a vision. And I'm going to get the best engineers in the world and instead of creating a new product and selling it to a corporation, I'm going to get a group of people to share the same vision as me. I'm going to change the world by changing our reliance on oil. And I am going to make a difference in the world and I am going to make a lot of money. Why not? And so people said, no, that's not possible. And he held on to that vision. And now Motor Trend Magazine never rated a car a, close to 100. They rated the Tesla car 103. It's the best car on the road. And it relies on no gas at all. That's a vision of the future. And I got run over by a truck and, and, um, and I broke six vertebrae in my spine. And, mm. and I had to make a decision at that time in my life. Um, because the diagnosis wasn't very good and neither was the prognosis. And I had to decide if I was going to spend the rest of my life on addictive medications and with uh, surgical rods in my spine or if I was going to see if the mind could actually heal the body. And so that was my wake-up call uh, in 1986. Right. And so, so I just um, – I was at the point where I just had to make a decision to see if it was actually the truth. If, if all of this that I learned was the truth, uh, let's, let's apply it. And so I was lucky enough to have – a dramatic change in my own personal health. And then I thought, God, yeah, if it worked on me as it worked on other people. So I started looking mm -hmm. into people that had, you know, been treating conventionally or non-conventionally and, and with a certain diagnosis 
and their condition was staying the same, getting worse, and all of a sudden it got better. And, and I just wanted to uh, look at what the cause was that was producing that effect. And so I interviewed, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that got, had gone through the process. And one of the most fundamental elements that uh, they all had in common was there were a lot of things that had to do with their mind. And, huh. uh, uh, and some people had specific diets and specific regimes. Some people used certain, um, you know, conventional, non-conventional protocols. But the, the commonality primarily was about how the mind uh, was really influencing the body. And, and they began to really take a closer look at how uh, they were thinking on a daily basis, uh, how they were acting uh, on a regular basis, and looking at how they feel uh, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And, and how you think and how you act and how you feel is your personality. And your personality has a very direct relationship with your personal reality, which means if you want to change your personal reality, if you want to change something about your life, you got to change. And so the process of change then becomes the fundamental process of going from some person that's familiar and known to you and stepping out and beginning to make different choices and to begin think mm. different, to thinking differently and begin to behave differently and speak differently and feel differently. And, and if you start thinking, acting and feeling differently, our research shows without a doubt, you're going to have dramatic changes in your biology. And if you do it enough times, you're going to become someone else. And the disease then all of a sudden exists in the old personality and mm, not in the wow. new personality. And, and you ask wow. the person, where's the cancer? Where's the rheumatoid arthritis? Where's the immune mediated condition? Uh, it's in the old person. I'm not that person any longer. That if you have been an experienced, uh, if you had experience of trauma, say for example, and it's created the feeling of fear and your fear is that it could happen again. And you're, you don't know this, but every time you think about that future, that p possible worst case scenario, scenario and you feel the emotion, you're conditioning your body to become the mind subconsciously of anxiety. So now, all, all you need now is some cue in your outer environment that says it's unsafe, that it's, there's damage there, that you're, you're a victim, something's bigger than you that could have an effect on you. Well, now, that feeling of fear is going to cause you to think thoughts equal to it. So the person then no longer needs the environment to feel that fear. They just have to have the thought about that condition now. And now they're literally knocking their brain and body out of balance by thought alone. And the body's constantly living in emergency mode. And it takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources to live in emergency mode all the time. And guess what system becomes compromised by it? Immune system. Your immune system. Why? Because you have two protection systems. You got a yeah. you got a system that protects you from dangers in your outer world. That's that's the gas pedal. That's the sympathetic nervous system. That's the fight or flight nervous system. Danger, threat out there. Use all the energy because you got to you got to survive. And when you survive, you got to take care of your body. So right. So so now, that system can work really well short term. It doesn't work really well if you keep it on all the time. Because if you're mobilizing all that energy for some threat in your outer world, there's no energy in your inner world for growth and repair. There's no energy for long-term building projects. And energy leaves the brain and it leaves the heart and it moves into these lower centers because now you're tapping the body's resources because there is an emergency. But whether the emergency is real or imagined, whether your anger is valid or justified or not, that the, you're tapping the body's very energy to heal by doing this. And the immune system says, well, we're part of really the other nervous system. We're the break. We're the clutch. We need to, we need to get into relaxation. We need to get back into balance again. And, and when we do, then we'll metabolize. Then we'll, we'll assimilate. We'll reproduce. We'll, we'll excrete properly. Mm -hmm. so, so now you got a, this kind of battle between the gas pedal and the brake, and the immune system says, Hey, listen, if there's foreign agents, if there's viruses, bacteria, molds, funguses, listen, we don't have a whole lot of energy here to deal with them because we're fighting this war out there. There's no homeland security. So they shut down certain receptors in the immune system. They shut down function of those lymphocytes, those white blood cells that are your inner army of protection. And it takes a lot of energy to fight a virus and a bacteria. But if there's right. no energy, hey, listen, it takes energy to raise the body's temperature. Where do you think that comes from? That's part of that branch called the autonomic nervous system. And the sympathetic, the gas pedal, 
is part of it. And the parasympathetic is the clutch is part of that autonomic nervous system. And it's a check and balance. Let's talk about the neuroscience of culture because there is a neuroscience to it. You have a brain that looks just like the person sitting next to you. And if I was to screw off the top of your heads and take out the, your brain and your partner's brain, someone sitting next to you, and I went like this, and I set them out, you probably wouldn't be able to tell them apart because you share the same structure in your brain. And we call that universal traits, and we call it gross anatomy. Now, because you share the same brain as the person sitting next to you, you smile when you're happy, you frown when you're sad, you sleep at night, and, well, this is Mexico, you sleep kind of late at night and get up kind of late in the morning. Come on, I'm kidding. And, you know, you grab a stick the same way, we speak a language, and because we share the same gross anatomy of the brain, we have very universal traits that we have in common. How many people are with me? But now, how your brain is wired is your individuality. And that's the minute architecture or the minute structure of the brain. So then, <clears throat> your brain is wired different than the person next to you because you have different experiences. But if you share the same experiences because you're in a relationship, then you have similar brains that are kind of relating. And relationships are built on common experiences. If we share the same experiences, we share the same emotions. And if we share the same emotions, we can relate with each other. So then, think about it like this. You have a hand. And because you have a hand, you, you have the same hand as the person next to you. There's only a certain amount of things you can do with your hand. But now, what makes you unique is your fingerprint. That gives you your individuality. And that is really the minute anatomy of something related to a hand. Are you with me? So now, what is the division that unifies both the universal traits and our individual traits? And the answer is culture. Culture. And culture is defined by the environment in which you live, the environment in which you work, the environment of your family. An environment is made up of just a few things. Are you ready? People, objects, things, places, time, pets, and that's pretty much your environment. So the culture of Mexico City is defined by the environment. You eat certain foods, you like certain music, you relate with one another because of the environment in which you live in. And that culture is created from the environment, which is different than the culture of Mongolia. Because it's a different environment and they have different traditions, they have different customs, because they've had to survive in a different environment. And so what unifies individual, individual traits and universal traits is called culture. Now think about this. Most cultures are defined by the customs they have, the traditions, the language, their survival skills, their habits, their attitudes, their beliefs, their history, their arts, their social structures that have unified them as an individual culture. Are you still with me? So the people you work with, the people you relate with, the people you interact with, you share a similar culture that bonds you both as an individual and as a species called human beings. And Mexicans are different than Australians because they live in a different environment and they have different traditions. You still with me? But we could say then that culture typically is defined by things that have worked in the past. So then, <clears throat> most cultures then have a choice. To create a new culture means then you have to define your culture as a vision of the future. But most people, their cultures are based on the past, present reality. What does that mean? We are in a changing world. And the world is changing faster than most people can keep up. 
And if you are going to stay defined by a memory of the past, you will not keep up with this culture because we are creating a global culture. So then, what defines the vision of the future to change a culture? And the answer is a very clear intention, a clear purpose combined with an elevated emotion. And when you combine a clear intention, like a vision of the future, along with an elevated emotion of inspiration and joy, you will create an empowered individual. What's something that you've said in the past that you were confident about it then, but now upon reflection, you're like, oh, actually, I've changed my mind about that. Oh, that it takes a long time to create reality. Okay, I'm going to ask you to expand on that because I like that answer. I, I want to know more. That's fascinating. Well, um, I think just like anything else, uh, you learn how to snowboard, you mm. go through that learning curve, you learn how to ride a bike, you go through that learning curve. Uh, that, that I used to think that creation was hard. Mm. I just thought it took a lot of energy and it took a lot of sacrifice and mm. you had to work for it. And, Great answer. And uh, God, I mean, even my definition of surrender mm. today is very different than it was just three months ago because mm. I'm always doing it. Mm. And so... I think that it doesn't have to be that way. I yeah. just think that it could be any way you want, and, that, and that. I'm working on that, uh, changing that belief. We call these people self-starters. This is entrepreneurial motivation. This is when you say, I'm going to do this because I said I was going to do it. Still a high form of motivation, but not the highest form. But what we know that people who have purpose motivation naturally are personally convicted. Their, their personal conviction is in alignment with their purpose because they have a reason to get up every day. If someone is so disconnected to their future, their greater future self, if they're so uh, it, negative thoughts, suicidal thoughts, often uh, hurting themselves potentially often, what can they start to do to just give some a little bit of relief and peace in their heart? Yeah, it's simple. Knowledge, experience, wisdom. Philosophy, initiate that philosophy, master mm -hmm. it. Yep. Mind, body, soul, thinking, doing, being. Learning it with your head, applying it with your hands, knowing it by heart. And this is the journey of knowledge because when you learn that information and you really study it, you are going to begin to see the world differently because yeah. your brain is changing. Then when you start saying, how can I use this? How can I apply it? How can I personalize it? How can I do something, initiate this information? What do I got to do? How do I get my behaviors to match my intentions? Now, this is the act of trial and error. It's so important. You don't make it the first time. You don't give up. You get up and you try to walk again. And you start learning how to do this. And so as you begin to do it over and over again, you start having new experiences. Yes. Well, new experiences enrich the circuits in your brain philosophically. And now the brain makes a chemical. And now you're feeling more unlimited. You're feeling more whole. You're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind intellectually understood. And now you are literally, literally starting to embody that knowledge. Yeah. It's becoming, it's signaling new Jesus, it's new information, but but you can't do it one day and expect your wealth to come. You got to do it over and over again. Yes. So the repetition of re practicing over and over again, neurochemically conditions the mind and body begin to work as one. You've done it so many times. The body now knows how, how to do it subconsciously. Subconscious. Just, mind. Like it, just like it knew how to subconsciously lean into trauma and victim mode right. for decades. Now the body's getting new information. It's going to adapt. And, and now <laughs> you're going to literally become that knowledge. You're going to become it. That's what you're going to become. And so now that's when you no longer have to try. It's who you are. It's yes. Yeah. You've memorized an internal order that's greater than anything in your outer world. That's going to tell you something else. And I was looking uh, closely and there are people that do this work, do, do this transformation work uh, in the meditations that we teach. And they're so impatient and they're so entitled uh, and they want an instantaneous change from the lack and pain <laughs> they're feeling, right? That they never overcome themselves in their meditation. They mm -hmm. never overcome themselves in the meditation. And when they finish their meditation, they believe in this work less. Mm. Then there are people who say, I can tell you the moment I made up my mind to change. 
because I had reached the end and I made a decision. And that decision to change carried an amplitude of energy that was greater than the hardwired programs in my brain and the emotional conditioning in my body. And my body literally responded to my mind in that moment, that the choice that I made became a moment in time I would never forget. And they'll tell you, and that's the moment I remember when I was going to change. Now, those people then, when they sit down to do the work, they're, they're, the chemotherapy hasn't worked, uh, the injections didn't work, uh, the radiation didn't work, uh, the surgery didn't work, the diet didn't work, the yoga didn't work. This is, this is now their end. They have nothing else to believe in but themselves. Mm. And they go all in, not 50%, not 60%. They're going all in. They have nothing else to believe in. Now, listen, when they go a little bit outside the known, they've got, they went a little further than where they normally would stop. They push themselves to that next limit. They started believing in themselves that they could do it a little bit more. They, they finish the meditation and they get up and believing it's, it's, it's working more than working less. They're, they're the person that's believing in themselves. Mm-hmm. That's why, mm-hmm. because it's not the work. It's your belief in yourself, right? It's, and then when you believe in yourself, you believe in possibilities. When you believe in possibilities, you got to believe in yourself. Who else are you going to believe in? Well, we had Bond University, uh, a, a university in Australia on the, on the Gold Coast. A uh, senior researcher took a large majority of my brain scans. And they had, she had them analyzed by her graduate students, and they, they statistically looked at everything. One of the most startling things for the research team was our community's ability to, go, to, to get to that point where there's nobody, no one, no really? thing, nowhere, no time. And I'm talking four seconds. I'm talking five seconds. I'm talking nine seconds. Just like, just give me a second. I know how to do this. They, they've practiced it enough times that the creative moment is when you get beyond yourself, mm-hmm. when you dissociate from everything known in your material world. Turns out when you do that and you start changing your brain waves, your brain waves slow down into alpha and theta, you're suppressing the memory bank of the known self that keeps you plugged into three-dimensional reality. Mm. When you quiet down this mechanism, now all of a sudden you start connecting to that field. And when you can stay conscious in those subconscious realms, when you can literally regulate and change brain waves, now you're in the operating system where you can make those significant changes. Well, here's the deal with trauma, and it's kind of an interesting thing because when you're traumatized, some threat or some danger or some condition in your outer world through your senses is changing how you feel in your inner world. And the quotient of change between the way you normally feel and some alarm state, when you change your internal state and move into that emergency mode, you narrow your focus on the cause and the brain freezes an image and takes a snapshot, and that's called a long-term memory. And now that image is branded holographically into the brain. So then they remember, we remember experiences better because we can remember how they feel. And, and that memory then changes the person's biology. So they think neurologically within the circuits of that experience, and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And how we think and feel becomes our state of being. Mm-hmm. So, so now the person biologically has changed and many times it's the strong emotion that begins to select and instruct the gene that creates disease. Why? Because if the environment signals the gene and that's the truth, that's epigenetics and the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion. The emotion that you feel from that event is literally selecting the gene for you to begin to change and the genes make proteins. And so the, the person, if it's, if it's strong enough, begins to wear their trauma, not just in their brain. Now it's in their body because every time they think about that trauma, every time they review it, every time they keep creating the imagery, they keep firing and wiring the circuits in their brain and they keep feeling the feeling emotionally in their body. And their body is so objective that it's believing it's living in the same past experience 50 to 100 times a day. And all Mm. you need is a stimulus and response, an image and if an emotion, a thought, and a feeling, and you're conditioning the body into the past. Well, you're conditioning the brain and body into the past. Why is our memory for pain stronger than our memory of a success or a joy? I really think that when the survival gene is activated, preservation is the key. Mm. So we can have 10 things that happen really great in our lives. You have a family member or somebody you know that does this. They have 10 really great things 
happen in their one thing bad, and they focus on that bad thing. Yeah. Why? Because the survival gene is activated. They want to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, so you put your attention on it because you don't want it to happen again. So what people do when they're aroused is they start thinking it's going to happen. And so they actually select the worst case scenario in their mind mm. and then emotionally embrace that future before it happens. Mm. And they're conditioning their body to become the mind of anxiety and fear. So in preservation and in survival, if you prepare for the worst, anything less that happens, you have a better chance of surviving. So that's the mechanism that takes place. So survival means you better take care of your body. Yeah. You better be aware of your environment and make sure there's no threats. And so you got to keep your eye out there. And you better be thinking about the future based on what you learned in the past. Now, there's nothing wrong with that when the analytical facilities are in balance. But when there's an arousal, Arousal, there's three things that create arousal. Fear, hostility and anger or aggression, and pain. And that arousal drives the brain into these high states of what we call high beta. Mm. And most people need something or someone or some circumstance or some drug or some pill or some computer game to change that internal state. And the moment they notice a change in their internal state, then they pay attention to what's causing it and they start developing a dependency on it, right? So it turns out that when we teach people how to self-regulate and change their brainwaves, uh, we could actually see then that the incoherence, the disorderliness that's taking place in the brain, you know, when you're over aroused, you're overly analytical mm -hmm. and you're shifting your attention from one problem to one person, to one thing, to one place, to another problem, to another circumstance, to your phone, to your car. And each one of those elements has a neurological network in the brain. So the arousal causes these different circuits to fire out of order and the brain is incoherent. So take two waves that are out of phase and mix them. When they interfere, they flatten out. There's no energy. So energy leaves the brain, right? So then when you're in arousal, you narrow your focus on the cause. If there's something rattling in the bushes and it's dark, you freeze and you narrow your focus on it and there's a rush of adrenaline and your pupils dilate and your heart starts to race and you're ready to run, fight, or hide. I mean, that's a survival moment, but what if it's your coworker mm. sitting right next to you or six feet away and, and you're judging them, you're the same arousals taking place and what's once very adaptive becomes very maladaptive. Now this is where it gets challenging. So when we teach people how to open their focus, we've done thousands and thousands of brain scans and they get beyond their analytical processes and they open their awareness and go from a convergent focus to a divergent focus and they learn how to relax and regulate their brain waves start to slow down into alpha. And then if they do it properly and they're connecting, those different compartments of the brain that were once firing out of order start to unify. Different communities form bigger communities. The brain starts to synchronize. And then all of a sudden you start seeing different compartments of the brain all in resonance. So now when they're all in resonance and they start interfering, when those waves come together, there's more energy in the brain. Mm. So when a person dials down the mechanism this neocortex that plugs us into three-dimensional reality, that keeps us aware of our body, that's the autobiographical self where everything's stitched in memory in there. When we start deactivating the mechanism here and we get beyond the memory bank of the known self and brain waves move into theta, we've, we've studied this so much. When a person can let their body be in a light state of sleep and feel so safe, that you can finally let go and surrender. The body is sleeping, but the mind is awake. And now the door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is wide open. And if they can regulate and stay there, something amazing happens. There is a release of energy from the body and their brain goes into a very, very super coherent state of gamma. And gamma is super consciousness. Now I'm not talking about a little gamma. I'm not talking about a lot of gamma. I'm not talking about a really lot of gamma. I'm talking about a supernatural amount of gamma. There's so much order and so much energy in the brain. Like if we were in an audience and we were all clapping like this, that could be alpha, right? Theta would be, and if everybody could do this, the slower we could do it, the more we can get our timing down, the more we can get coherent. But if we were doing this, it would be really hard for all of us to do that at the same time. So it takes a lot of order, a lot of awareness, a lot of energy to be able to create that kind of uh, order. So that's how fast the brain is and that arousal that's taking place 
is ecstasy. That arousal is bliss. It is the most familiar, unfamiliar feeling that people ever have. And that memory then that the person has that is so profoundly different than the feeling of success, the feeling of wealth, the feeling of uh, orgasm or love or whatever. This is a new one and it's a thrill. And the person notices a dramatic change in their inner state. And with that experience comes a very lucid picture, a very profound insight, a download of information. That's the moment then the body many times rewrites the biological program. Energy is informing matter and the autonomic nervous system is regulating. It's in high order. And remember, disease is autonomic dysregulation. Mm. Now it's getting into a very, very high frequency of order and it's sending very coherent information to the cells and tissues, sending energy to the cells and tissues and cells begin to emit more coherent light and information. And then there's the disease and there it's not. The recognition that when you're assimilating a negative thought or a negative judgment or a negative emotion, envy, greed, whatever it may be, that's actually lowering your energy. Yeah. And when you get to that place where you're experiencing that incredible bliss right here, you can't. You can't, yeah. And even if you have the thought, and the thought will still come because we still have those thoughts. But the thought yeah. will be an understanding Correct. of human nature because you're no longer at that vibrational level any yeah. longer. You're rising above it, you know? Yeah. And and I think more and more people are starting to figure that out. And, and, and the people in their lives are like, no, my husband... <laughs> My husband is a changed person. No, yeah. he's not the same guy. I know him. I know he's completely different. Yeah. And the guy's just like, yeah, I feel amazing. I feel <laughs> great. And all it was was sitting in the fire yes. for a little bit of time until the body finally moved out of the past into the present moment. And yeah. so the causes of this, like I always say, you never know what you're doing today and how you're doing it, who you're going to affect tomorrow when you do this work. And that's what we're seeing. And people are, they're, they're, they're getting promotions. Uh, they're getting all these wonderful things, not because of anything that they're doing. Mm. They're just different. Yeah. And people notice that and they want those people yeah. in the position to make better decisions for the whole. And I, and I think that's, uh, that's how we change the world. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already occurred. The latest research in neuroscience says you can change your brain from living in the past to living in the future. And can you fall in love with that vision to such a degree that you come out of your resting state and change guilt or suffering into inspiration and joy and gratitude, to such a degree that your body as the unconscious mind does not know the difference between that external event and what you're creating internally, so that your body believes it's living in that future in the present moment, and you begin to signal new genes in new ways to change your body to look like the event has already occurred. The latest research in epigenetics says you can change your body by thought alone. Now reason this with me. If there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the event has already occurred, your brain and body are no longer living in the past. They're living in the future. And you will walk right into your vision. Now, most people in this audience, all of you, have done something great in your life. You all have. A reason this. You woke up one day or you had a wild thought out of nowhere. And that thought was a possibility in the future, something new you wanted to experience. And the moment you started thinking about this experience, the moment you started contemplating 
this potential reality, you turned on a part of your brain called the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being. It's 40% of your entire brain. It is the creative center. And it has connections to all other parts of the brain. And the moment you said, what would it be like to be a leader? What would it be like to be successful? What would it be like to have this vision come true? The moment you ask that open-ended question, you turned on this part of the brain. Because the rest of the brain is just a bunch of automatic programs. And now the frontal lobe, the creative center, wakes up. And it has connections to the entire brain. It's the CEO. It's the boss. It's the symphony leader of the brain. And the moment you get creative, the frontal lobe begins to select different networks of neurons that are stored in your brain from things you've learned or experienced. And as you begin to think a what-if question, it begins to select these different networks and begins to seamlessly piece them together and making your brain fire in new sequences and in new patterns and new combinations. And whenever you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind because mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. And the moment those neurons fire in tandem, you get a picture in your mind, a hologram, a vision, an abstraction. And for those people who are passionate, that thought that they're thinking begins to create an elevated emotion. They become inspired. They feel enthusiastic, in theos, filled with God. They become passionate. They started to open their hearts. And all of a sudden, they're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion. And it's the combination of a clear intention and an elevated emotion in our research over and over again that proves then the person now is changing fundamentally, changing biologically, changing internally. And their brain and body are moving from living in the past into living in the future. We have such compelling evidence in science with brain scans. You can make your brain work better. You can make your heart work better. You can make your immune system work better. You can make your cells go from really sick to really healthy. We've got great evidence. You can become immune to serious viruses. You can be immune to bacteria. We've got the measurements. You can lengthen your life. We have great evidence, and the people aren't monks. They're not, they're not nuns. They're not religious scholars. They're just common people. And then we have testimony of people who are the example of truth. They are, they are the example of truth. I would rather have dinner with those people than anybody, anybody else. They're, they're, they know something, mm -hmm. right? So evidence then becomes the loudest voice, right? And, and that's what I think what people are looking for right now. The truth is so lost in sensationalism and the truth is so lost in emotional agreement. Mm -hmm. And so people who want to feel fear they program themselves and accept, believe, and surrender that. People who want to be, hate, be hateful, it's all there. It's all there, and it's a, it's a matrix to find the way out, right? And, and, and I, think, I think there's a door. I just, I just think that we have to trust the innate information that, that comes from within us. Really incredible moments uh, in the last year where people that were traumatized from childhood, that were abused sexually, physically, emotionally, that were suicidal, that had all kinds of health conditions, they came to the edge of that emotion that kept them connected to the past. And they were ready to give up in one meditation because they, they never had felt an emotion like this that they could remember, that mm. it was so intense. And they thought about all the times for the last year that they never missed a day of doing a meditation, even when they didn't feel like it, or when they wanted to quit halfway through and they didn't, they went all the way. They thought about all those times that they went to that point and they went one more time. Really? And their, and their words are always the same. And my heart blew wide open. And I look back at my entire past and I don't want to change one thing in my past because it brought me to this present moment. And I can see my betrayers. I could uh, see the people in my life uh, that had a hand in this. And I have nothing but compassion for them. 
because now the person is no longer viewing that past from the same level of consciousness. They're viewing it from a place of love, of wholeness, mm -hmm. and they see the greater good of all of it. And now their, their, <laughs> their, their conditions, their health conditions, their endometriosis, their uterine tumors, I mean, whatever it is, literally goes, disappears and they have an incredible, incredible change in their brain chemistry. They're in love with life. They're off their meds. Uh, they're not suicidal. They're, wh why would they be? They're free. So it can happen in an instant when the heart is healed. And everybody gets the new signal. The body's out of the past. The body's no longer feeling the emotions of the past. And sometimes we got to come right up against that edge. That's, yeah. the, that's the great moment. Our immune system is kind of like our rudimentary nervous system. It has uh, cells that are mobile, and they're called plasma cells or white blood cells. And their job is an internal defense. And many of our body's plasma cells uh, line the mucous membranes, gut, uh, the digestive tract, uh, all the orifices of the body, the nose, the mouth, ears. And it's a line of defense against foreign invaders and toxins. And when the immune system is uh, facing uh, some foreign invader, whether it be a virus, a bacteria, a mold, a fungus, uh, some foreign agent, it is the army of plasma cells that move towards the danger uh, and begin to uh, attack these foreign agents. And there are cells in your immune system called T cells. And T cells are like the ninjas of the immune system. They release uh, very powerful chemicals that can uh, denature and break down any foreign invader. And T cells have these little trumpets that stick out uh, on their receptor site. So picture this big circular spherical blob, and you have all these different receptors. And these T cell receptors are these long trumpet um, um, appendages. And when they come up to a virus or they come up to a bacteria, when they come up to even a cancer cell, they notice that it is a foreign agent and immediately this T cell receptor attaches to that foreign agent and begins to release a lot of unhealthy chemicals that begin to cause that foreign agent to, to die and then memorizes that foreign agent and passes the information on to the army of the rest of the white blood cells in the body and, and this is a strong immune system and when plasma cells and white blood cells uh, begin to function well they release chemicals called immunoglobulins and immunoglobulins are proteins that are in the shape of a Y and those Y shaped proteins are antibodies and what they do is when the, the white blood cell releases an antibody uh, it begins to block the receptors of the foreign agent that's trying to attack uh, the white blood cells. So when a, a healthy immunoglobulin is uh, released, uh, it suppresses uh, the, the warfare, uh, the, uh, the cell receptors that are trying to attack the white blood cell. And now you have a strong defense, you have a strong immune system, and uh, your body right now is doing that. In fact, your body is always evaluating all those foreign agents, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, or even a cancer cell. And it's working to keep the body in balance and the immune system, a strong, healthy immune system, does that constantly, always behind the scenes of your awareness. If you give people sound information, and then they can repeat that information, they're wiring it in their brain they're creating a new model of understanding. If you show them how to apply that information, if they do it properly, they will have some type of transformation. That transformation isn't something that causes people to feel bad or unworthy. It causes them to open their hearts. It causes them to feel joy, to feel gratitude. They feel differently. And if you're able to then create that elevated emotion and you teach people more information, they will continue to transform themselves, and that's called evolution. If you think the same thoughts, the same thoughts always lead to the same choices. The same choices lead to the same behaviors. 
the same behaviors create the same experiences, and the same experiences produce the same feelings, and you're now caught in your old self. But new thoughts should lead to new choices, and new choices should lead to new behaviors. New behaviors should create new experiences, and new experiences should create new emotions, and that should inspire evolution. We say that your personality creates your personal reality. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. We could say that your personality is your state of being. So now, geniuses, if you keep thinking the same thoughts, keep demonstrating the same behaviors, keep living by the same feelings and emotions, your personal reality is going to stay exactly the same. But if you have new thoughts that lead to new choices, that demonstrate new actions, that create new experiences, that cause you to feel differently, you will begin to walk into a new future. How many people understand this? So most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. So, crossing the river of change, going from the old self to the new self, requires you stepping into the unknown. And if you are now in the unknown and you feel uncomfortable because you're leaving guilt behind, you leave unworthiness behind, you see, the biggest problem with most people is they want to create wealth, but they feel lack. They want a new life, but they feel unworthy. That's mind and body in opposition. And our research shows that you can teach people how to recondition their body to a new mind. And when that occurs, they begin to create very powerful things in their life. What do you believe is the purpose of life overall? To figure out the purpose of life. Okay. No, I mean, I, mean, I, I really think it's, I think the mathematics uh, that I've looked at says there's infinite experiences to have. You will never know the end. Mm -hmm. So then if you study any religion, I, I mean, I've looked at a lot of them, this concept of eternity, mm -hmm. that the soul is going to be around for eternity, mm -hmm. that's a long time. Mm -hmm. And that means you got to be okay with you <laughs> for a very long time. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's the creation of more experiences. And I think to, to f I think we came from source, from singularity, from oneness. Uh, and we have descended down into density, uh, fooled by our senses into separation. Mm -hmm. And every single being has a spark of oneness of the divine within them. And we got so separate that we now have our own free will to answer the question, is there more? Because mm -hmm. if you're oneness, it gets kind of boring after a while. Like, is there anything else? Well, the moment you ask if there's anything else, you're no longer oneness. You're something other than oneness, right? And you're mm -hmm. a, 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 a different consciousness, separate from oneness. So I think then we live life, and then when we can predict the feeling of everything that can happen in our life and it gets boring and we're not impressed by anyone or anything, we ask the same question. Is there more? And that's when the soul goes, all right, well, it's been... How many lifetimes you've been doing this? Okay, there's an awakening. And, the, and we ask that question, and then all of a sudden, we start getting information and books and stuff and meet people, and it gets exciting, and, and it's, the, it's, it's how the universe works. And so we climb out of this, and I just think there's so many incredible experiences that are left in the unknown uh, that we get to have. And, and then, of course, when, when the journey's over and you've evolved to that point, uh, then you take that wisdom and you, you say, here's what I learned. And it was scary down there. And I was like, boy, I tell a great story. And then you hang out there and you go, is there anything else besides all? And then here we go again. It just never ends. I don't know. That's my theory. So how do we brainwash ourselves in times of stress and anxiety in order to become more peaceful, loving, and successful in the future? How do we brainwash ourselves in a different way? Sure. Well, um, that's what uh, I have spent about my whole life. <laughs> I mean, and and um, 
Wow. I mean, the first and most important thing is that you have to understand that if 95% of who you are is a set of unconscious programs, mm. then the first step is lighting a match in a dark place. If you want to become someone else, you got to become aware of who you are. Yes. <laughs> that means you got to start thinking about what you've been thinking about. You got to start paying attention to how you speak. You got to be mm -hmm. conscious. You demystify the word meditation and the word meditation literally means become familiar with yeah. And when you become so familiar with your thoughts, so aware of your emotions, so conscious of your habits that you wouldn't go unconscious to, to them again, now you're no longer the program, right? Mm -hmm. so, so getting people disentangled from that program, we found out is a formula. And when we teach people how to do certain things with their focus and opening their awareness, when we teach them how to create a very disorderly brain that has been driven by the hormones of stress into a more orderly, coherent brain, and teach them how to open their focus and practice that, they'll come up against those thoughts and they'll become so familiar with them, listen to this, they won't believe them anymore when they come up any longer. Wow. And so when they hear them in their day, they'll be like, that's not gonna stop me from my future. So if they're sitting there and they wanna quit, just because they're sitting still, and they're not quitting, then they're developing a will that's greater than those programs. And you're breaking out of the shell. And you keep doing that, you're going to get up and do the work every day because you did it yesterday. And you're going to want to do more of that because you're getting out of your past and it feels better. And if you keep doing that and you keep feeling better every day, the question is, why wouldn't you do it every day? Because you would ultimately just feel better. And then yeah. the more whole you feel, means the more you are connected to your future. Imagine if you felt every single day, and this is what I do, work on. If I could stay connected to the emotions of my future all day long, there's no way I would be looking for when it would be happening. How could I look for when it would be happening if I feel like it's happening? I wouldn't look anymore, which means I wouldn't be separate from it. And that's when you start creating the magic, right? That's when you're in that zone. And that's when that reaffirms that personality that you're becoming. And now, you don't, you know, wake up in the morning and go, oh, God, I got to create my future. No, you're, you're, you're going to jump out of bed. Because Excited. You're, you're not going to want that magic to end. If you're alive in this world and you haven't been experiencing the quickening, I mean, I mean, yeah. you know, I said to uh, someone the other day, the day where you end your day and feel complete because you finished all your work, you'll never have that. And, yeah. you know, there's always more emails and more things to check, right? <laughs> so the demand has 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 pressed us into this crazy realm mm. of, of, uh, of, of um, multitasking. And I think that you start shifting, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you're shifting your attention all over the board, your energy is scattered. Yeah. So then when you start disconnecting from everybody, your boss, your coworker, you know, the news, uh, your cell phone, your computer, and you start going this way, I think it's, uh, into the present moment, then if where you place your attention is where you place your energy and you're truly in the present moment, you got a lot of energy to execute. You got yeah. a lot of energy to use and you want to be able to do that eyes open. The more well. scattered your energy, the less you have to focus on pushing one thing forward. That's why people's dreams forward. don't yeah. happen because... Too scattered. It, yeah. it, it, there's no... Look, look, if you keep putting your attention on some future experience that you are imagining with your mind, your body's going to follow your mind right there because that's where your energy is. But if you're putting your attention on everything known in your life, the shower, the coffee maker, you know, right. the the toilet and your body's following your mind every day to the known, but we want your body to follow your mind to the unknown, right? Yeah. Enough people get to doing that and you could do better in creating things in your life that we see this. Wealthy people in our work that have focused on wealth, some of them living in the back seat of their car, some of them bankrupt that now have multi-million dollar companies. What do you think they want to do with that money? They want to give it away. Yeah, give it back. Let me tell you yeah. why. Not because of any other reason is that they now know that they create more. Right. Well, why, why, if you're abundant, why abundance to me has changed. Abundance means I have more than I need, like way more than I need. So if I have way more than I need and I know how to create it, then take it. I'll create more of it. So now you're no longer holding on in scarcity. You're making a difference. So wealthy people that have created a lot of wealth in this work, they want to give back. They want to make a difference. And I think that that's how we're innately wired. Mm -hmm. I think we're all innately wired to care for one another, yeah, to make a difference. In the living organism, our living organism, our community, we heal one another, that's what we do. Right. We inform one another, we encourage one another, we support one another. 
we shine for one another, not to outshine another person, to shine to show them that they can shine. And that's, that to me is super healthy. Mm -hmm. So then I'm, I'm applauding your success because I want you to succeed because you're telling me that if you can do it, I can do it. So, right. so there's no longer any separation. I think that's hopeful for the world. Then you start celebrating diversity. Then you're like, wow, you're way different than me. I want to I wanna study you because I want to bring that into who I'm becoming. Mm. Yeah, you, you, you create a strong community that way. What are the things that disturb or disconnect our awakening and connection to the divine? A lot of times when people, uh, they hit that point, they try mm. to reproduce it the same way as we mm. talked about, and you mm. can't. Yeah, you can't do it the same way because that's redundancy. But also, uh, many times, uh, we have the experience and we start to try. Mm. And because trying is matter trying to change matter, and, and, and so we're forcing, we're controlling, we're predicting. And, and, then the, uh, and when we do that, then, of course, we're in separation, and we're mm. waiting for the event to happen to feel the emotion, right? And I've done that <laughs> long enough. And it's actually, we have to lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want for something greater to occur, and it takes practice of surrender, right? Mm. So that's one element. I also think that our responses emotionally, like uh, 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 let's just say that a person gets connected to the future. They get connected to the energy of their future. They feel it. It's really great. And then they start their day, and then two hours later, they're, they're feeling something else because some person or some circumstance altered their state. Well... They just disconnected from the energy of the future, and now they're back to the energy of the past. Don't expect anything to change in your life because yeah. it doesn't work that way. So then, then when they get back to that old self again, then they say, what's wrong with me? I failed. They didn't do it right. No, that's all the program. You show up again, and you go after it again. Uh, so familiar feelings uh, cause us to no longer see through the lens of the future. We're seeing through the lens, lens of, of the, the past. past. And, mm -hmm. and, and we color reality that way. So um, I, think, uh, I think familiar emotions uh, get in the way as well. And then, of course, there's always belief. Mm -hmm. And a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again until you hardwired in your brain. And all beliefs are based on past experience. So a person has an experience. The stronger the emotion they have from that circumstance, the more they pay attention to the cause and the brain freezes a frame, takes a snapshot, and that's called the memory. Mm -hmm. The moment they draw a conclusion about that experience, they'll think neurologically within those circuits and they'll feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. Thinking and feeling, thinking and feeling, belief becomes an unconscious or subconscious state of being. They don't, most people don't even know they have beliefs about things, about God, about relationships, about money, because it's, it's not a conscious thing, it's a subconscious thing. Yeah. So in order to change a belief or a perception, about yourself and your life, you gotta go all in. Mm -hmm. It's not like you go 50% in, you gotta go all in, you gotta make a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that causes the body to respond to the mind, that the choice that you make becomes a moment in time you'll never forget and you would say, I remember the moment I made up my mind to change and the stronger the emotion you feel, the more you'll pay attention to the decision. And that's a huge stone you drop in the quantum field. Big splash, big waves. So your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of all the things you've learned and experienced to this moment. So if you wake up every morning and get out of bed on the same side, shut the alarm clock off with the same finger, shuffle into the bathroom and use the toilet like you always do, go and get a cup of coffee and drink coffee out of your favorite mug, then get in the shower and wash yourself off in the same routine way, drive to work, get to work, see the same people, that push the same emotional buttons, do the same things that you've memorized and do so well, then hurry up and go home, and hurry up and check your emails, and hurry up and check your Facebook, and then watch your favorite television show, then hurry up and go to bed. Here's my question. Did your brain change at all that day? 
We could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same unconscious actions, living by the same emotions, but secretly expecting your life to change. So there's a principle in neuroscience. And the principle says, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So if you're thinking the same thoughts, making the same choices, demonstrating the same behaviors, reproducing the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, and then produce the same emotions, you're going to hardwire your brain into a very finite signature. Because as you fire and wire the same circuits in the same way, those circuits begin to become more connected. And by the time you're 35 years old, this is science now, we become a set of memorized behaviors, unconscious habits, automatic emotional reactions, beliefs and perceptions, and even attitudes that function just like a computer program. And if you do something over and over and over again, the repetition of those actions over time conditions your body to know how to do it well, better than your mind. And a habit is when your body knows better than your mind, where you've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it better than the brain. And so 95% of most people's behaviors, attitudes, thoughts, beliefs, emotional reactions are subconscious programs. So why is that important? Because you're here this week to learn new information. And every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new synaptic connections. Physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment and the footprints of consciousness is called learning, making new connections. And the Nobel Prize laureate Kandel in the year 2000 found that when people learned one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. But if they didn't review that information, if they couldn't repeat it, if they couldn't remember it, those circuits pruned apart in hours or days. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. Your body rejects viruses all really? the time. Of course. It has memorized certain viruses that you've been exposed to. And it has memorized certain bacteria that you've been exposed to. And it's beaten those viruses. It's not every virus wins in the body. The body has an intelligence and, it's, and it has quite a library of huh. memories in the, in, the, in the white blood cells. So your body is fighting viruses and bacteria all the time. There's a constant competition going on. Really? So our research shows that four days of opening your heart releases immunoglobulin A, your body's primary defense against bacteria and viruses. It's better than the flu shot. It's the body's natural flu shot. And that's the innate intelligence of the body saying, I got this, I got a lot of energy. In fact, I got a surplus of energy. In fact, I'm radiating energy and now nothing too much in my energy. outer world. It will, now my <laughs> outer world is not controlling my inner world. My inner world now is functioning independent of what's going on in my outer world and now, Nitric you're manifesting. Oxide. You're yeah, manifesting. Now, ah, now you got it. Now you're, you're in a creative state. because People this are is coming to you, yes. Right, exactly. Now you're a magnet. Now you have a field, right? And you have energy uh, to heal. And our research shows that that field around your body will actually expand. You, you radiate more light and information. Cells are getting new information that are, that are causing uh, um, light to be exchanged between cells and information. Now the body's getting an upgrade. So... So that immunoglobulin wow. A in four days went up 50%. So now we now know that if it's going up 50%, that then the immune system was getting a new signal. And nitric oxide then causes 
another chemical to activate the arteries in your heart to swell. And now, just like when energy moves into your sexual organs and it swells with blood and you have energy there, the same intensity, it moves into your heart. And now, now the heart is activated. And what do you feel? You feel an incredible amount Bulletproof. of love. Yeah, and love. you, feel, you yeah. feel you feel whole. And now mm. the more whole you feel, our research shows, then the less separate you feel from the things you want in your life because you feel like you already have them. You only want things when you're in lack, but when you feel whole, then it feels like it's already happened. And that mm. tends to be the exact emotion that causes those synchronicities and serendipities and coincidences to happen in our life. And you say to a person, what are you doing? And they're saying, I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> just so loving happy. life. I'm being yeah. myself. I'm, yeah, right. exactly. I'm free. I'm free from the past. I'm free yeah. from my, my story of the past. I'm, in fact, I'm more connected to the energy of my future than I am to the energy of my past. I think that if we share the same experiences, because mm -hmm. we like the same things, we share the same emotions. Mm -hmm. And if we share the same experiences, we share the same emotions, I can relate to you so we can exchange ideas and information. Yep. And if we share the same energy, energy is information. Mm -hmm. So many people, as an example, they use each other to reaffirm their their dependency on suffering. So I suffer more than you, then you say, I, you, I suffer, you suffer more than me. We, we have this thing, we just complain with each other. Well, that's the same resonance, the same frequency, and there's a match, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes to the same means if, you, if, you're, if you're someone who has a, a uh, accountability partner that, that you exchange ideas like this with, and it's a yeah. different frequency and different energy. So when energy comes together and it's constructive, something comes out of it. Yeah, you feel it, right? It's, and you feel an elevation. If there's dissonance, then your, your sensing meter is how you feel about that person many times in your gut or in your heart or wherever, and there's, there's a, a destructive interference and there's no energy involved. So I think that's just a practice, but really the ultimate mastery is to be able to be in such resonance, such coherence, that when you walk in the room that you raise everybody's energy and you don't let your energy drop because of any circumstance or any condition, then that would be greater than your environment, right? And that's, mm. that's the model uh, that we use. So imagine 1,500 people in an event where everybody's getting super coherent and the interference that's going on in the room yeah. is creating these high amplitudes. Now, we've measured that in the room, and the energy in the room is off the chart many times. There's, I mean, there's energy for healing in there. There's energy for all kinds of things that can happen. So... We brought it to life with our awareness. And so the more elevated the emotion, love, gratitude, freedom, bliss, ecstasy, the higher the frequency. Mm. So, but it turns out you can have a collective group of people with a lot of energy and be incoherent and it creates entropy. Yeah. You could have a smaller group of people that are highly coherent and put out a very big signal. Mm -hmm. So when we see a collective really get coherent, Wow, the energy in the room opens up doors of possibilities that I would I would never expect. I mean, I I don't I don't have, know how to explain some of the phenomenological things that happen, but that's that's everybody's divine. Like everybody's everybody's in that state. They're they're in that elevated state. So I think our I think our our truth meter mm -hmm. is really whether we feel lifted uh, or we feel like uh, we've been robbed. Because if you are not defined by some vision that is bigger than you, and you are not passionate about that vision, then you're left with the old hardware of the past in your brain, and you will be predictable in your life. So would you agree then? New thoughts, new information should lead to new choices. New choices should lead to new behaviors. And new behaviors should create new experiences. And new experiences should produce new emotions. And those new emotions should drive new thoughts. And that's called evolution. So if your brain is a record of the past, and you don't have a vision of the future, then you are living in the past. And you will never arrive at that new future that if you have been an experienced 
uh, if you had experience of trauma, say, for example, and it's created the feeling of fear and your fear is that it could happen again. And you're, you don't know this, but every time you think about that future, that pr possible worst case scenario, scenario, and you feel the emotion, you're conditioning your body to become the mind subconsciously of anxiety. So now, all, all you need now is some cue in your outer environment that says it's unsafe, that it's, there's damage there, that you're, you are a victim, something's bigger than you that could have an effect on you. Well, now, that feeling of fear is going to cause you to think thoughts equal to it. So the person then no longer needs the environment to feel that fear. They just have to have the thought about that condition now. And now they're literally knocking their brain and body out of balance by thought alone. And the body's constantly living in emergency mode. And it takes a lot of energy a lot of resources to live in emergency mode all the time. And all the time. guess what system becomes compromised by immune it? system, your immune system. Why? Because you have two protection <laughs> systems. You got a, yeah. you got a system that protects you from dangers in your outer world. That's, that's the gas pedal. That's the sympathetic nervous system. That's a fight or flight nervous system, danger, threat out there. Use all the energy because you gotta, you gotta survive. And when you survive, you gotta take care of your body. So, right. so, so now, that system can work really well short term. It doesn't work really well if you keep it on all the time. Because if you're mobilizing all that energy for some threat in your outer world, there's no energy in your inner world for growth and repair. There's no energy for long term building projects. And energy leaves the brain and it leaves the heart and it moves into these lower centers because now you're tapping the body's resources because there is an emergency. But whether the emergency is real or imagined, whether your anger is valid or justified or not, that the, you're tapping the body's very energy to heal by doing this. And the immune system says, well, we're part of really the other nervous system. We're the break, we're the clutch. We need to, we need to get into relaxation. We need to get back into balance again. And, and when we do, then we'll metabolize, then we'll, we'll assimilate, we'll reproduce, we'll, we'll excrete properly. Mm -hmm. So. So now you got a, this kind of battle between the gas pedal and the brake and the immune system says, hey, listen, if there's foreign agents, if there's viruses, bacteria, molds, funguses, listen, we don't have a whole lot of energy here to deal with them because we're fighting this war out there. There's no homeland security. So they shut down certain receptors in the immune system. They shut down function of those lymphocytes, those white blood cells that are your inner army of protection. And it takes a lot of energy to fight a virus and a bacteria. But if there's right. no energy, hey, listen, it takes energy to raise the body's temperature. Where do you think that comes from? That's part of that branch called the autonomic nervous system. And the sympathetic, the gas pedal is part of it. And the parasympathetic is the clutch is part of that autonomic nervous system. And it's a check and balance. But so you stay in emergency for an extended period of time. And now you're exposed to some antigen or some mm -hmm. uh, external substance, some foreign agent. When we become the living example of truth, when we actually embody this, uh, that um, there are no limits to what we can do. And I'm hopeful <clears throat> with human beings that, um, that uh, we have this capacity. And, uh, and of course, when we believe in ourselves, uh, we believe in possibility. Mm -hmm. And when we believe in possibilities, we believe in ourselves. And I think that is the ultimate belief. Memory is creative. That in fact, 50% of that story, you embellish. People make up that story. <laughs> Let me tell you why they make up that story. Because they excuse themselves for the fact that they haven't been able to change since that event. They'll have to make it sound worse than it really was. To make and it harder to grow and change. So that they can reaffirm their limited sense of their inability to change. So then that story becomes more and more of a story and it's less of the truth because you got to work yourself up into a state. There were lions and tigers and there was, right. you know, there were helicopters. Snowstorms. And yeah, and everybody was firing bullets. <laughs> worse than you could possibly imagine. And then you got to feel that emotion, right? And then you yes. look at, oh yeah, it must have been really bad. Now that's, that's your identity now. That's your identity. You think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. Out of those 60 to 70,000 thoughts that you think in one day, 90% of those thoughts 
are the same thoughts as the day before. So if you believe that your thoughts somehow are connected to your life, then the same thoughts always lead to the same choices. The same choices always lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences, and the same experiences produce the same emotions. And those very same emotions drive the very same thoughts. And your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your neurohormones, and even your genetic expression is equal to how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. So then, if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, then you would have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. You would have to become aware of your unconscious thoughts and observe them. You would have to pay attention to your automatic habits and behaviors and modify them. And you would have to look at the emotions you live by every single day that are connected to your past and decide if those emotions belong in your future. You see, most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. In our community, at least, people who have relationships that are built uh, from our community uh, tend to be more long-lasting because they're more self-aware. Yeah. And so there's no blame, there's no excuses, there's no make wrong, there's no competition, there's none of that. There's just, this is who I am, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that the ultimate goal is when you reach the point in your life when how you appear to the world is who you really are, that level of transparency mm. is, it takes no effort. Right. You can be yourself and, and, and you know, people say to me, wow, you're, you're pretty approachable. And I say, well, God, I work so hard every day on overcoming myself in the morning, <laughs> yeah, overcoming yeah. my ego. Yeah. Why would I want to build it up the next day? Because i got to face that guy again yeah, tomorrow morning. So why not just keep, you know, you know taking those edges and, and smoothing mm -hmm. them down so that, so that you're, you're less unconscious to all of those yeah. programs that are, are built in relationships. You asked if is it possible then can, that people can heal that quickly in one week. Yeah, because... What if they create an inner event that carries an amplitude of gratitude or joy or freedom, breakthrough from the chains of the past, and when the body is liberated and you feel that elevated emotion, the stronger the emotion you feel from that breakthrough, the more you're going to pay attention to the image in your mind. And now you're now beginning to brand new circuitry in the brain and your body's being conditioned into a new future. And the stronger the emotion you feel, and the more you pay attention to the picture, the more you're conditioning the body over time to the future instead of the past. So now you keep knocking on that genetic door emotionally, then that emotion ultimately signals a new gene that upregulates up that gene to produce better proteins. And the person then all of a sudden starts healing. And we have research to show that people can do that in four days, signal genes to reduce cancer cells. And wow. To, to signal stem cells to, to suppress, um, uh, to go to active tissues and repair them and regenerate them and suppress uh, inflammation. Well, you know, you come with a lot of genes and they're just a library of potentials. They're just a storehouse of information of possibilities. So then you got to get the right <coughs> signal, the right lock into the key that begins to select and instruct genes that cause genes to make different proteins. And you can regulate so many different genes, the same genes, you can regulate them differently. So when they upregulate, they start producing really healthy and robust proteins. And that's, that's enzymes, that's tissue, that's structure, that's function, that's hormones, uh, it's immune, immunoglobulins. When they downregulate because of some alarm when there's not a lot of energy for long-term building projects, well, then you keep doing that then the body starts producing cheaper proteins. It's a different signal. It's not a time for growth. When you hit pay dirt like that, when you connect, when you connect to the field, when you connect to the divine, whatever you want to call it, when your consciousness merges with a greater consciousness and that arousal creates ecstasy, bliss, oneness, whatever you want to call that, 
you realize that it never came from anything out there. It yeah. didn't come from the wardrobe or the facelift, the sports car or whatever. It, it came from within you. And so mm. you stop looking out there for it. Mm. And now the love affair begins. Mm. And you never want to miss a date because it's just too good. Mm. So that memory then, that is what I'm after. Because when you have those transcendental moments and you understand this, yeah. the experience of that transcendental moment lays down new circuitry in the brain. That's what experience does. Yeah. And the experience produces a feeling, but it's not chemical. It's electric and it's orderly and every cell of your body is jig jiggling in you know, order. And, they're, and you're aroused and you're awakened, right? <laughs> you have to admit when that occurs, your spectrum of reality is going to broaden. Some conditioning, some illusion, something is removed and you start seeing reality as it is. And all of a sudden, you start seeing the part that we edit out for survival. Mm -hmm. Now you start seeing patterns and lights and information that are transcendent of three-dimensional reality and your spectrum, why? Because your brain had the experience and the circuitry's there, and now your, your experience of the world changes. You get an upgrade to the, to the VR set, <laughs> to the virtual reality set. Oh, you got the upgrade, you got 2.0, and now it looks different. Everything looks different. Everybody looks different. You, mm. The world, look, you're seeing beauty more. Well, and there's more holism and more connection and sounds and words and music and sense and sight and light is all working together. Uh, I mean, that's the blessing of an awakening, right? That's where, yeah. we're, that's where we're going. What do you think the world humanities challenge will be over the next decade as we enter 2020? Um, back to the principle, Lewis, of just different paradigms beginning to collapse you know, economically, politically, socially, environmentally, religiously, yes. education, journalism, the, uh, you know, medicine, um, they, they have to uh, move into chaos. Mm. And chaos is just unpredictable. Because they're not order. working. Yeah, exactly. But now here's the challenge for humanity. You have one of two ways to embrace the breakdown of those, those, those paradigms. You can face them with anger and hostility and fear, and you are only contributing to more of it. Uh, we have to see that those breakdowns are essential for something greater to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> we can't wait for governments to take care of us. That's t we can't wait for uh, medicine to, to give us a drug that's gonna heal us mm -hmm. from a condition. The truth is, with a greater level of consciousness, the change in awareness because of information, the greatest challenge we have as those, as those paradigms break down is to no longer emotionally react in the same way and be victims. You can't say, this president, this person, this, this whatever, is actually making me feel this way and think this way. Basically, you're in the program that you're, something outside of you is controlling you, yeah. how you feel and how you think. So then to self-regulate then is to say how I think and feel is going to change my outer environment. So then mm. we're all faced with great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And we are at that point, at that nexus point in our, our evolution as a species. So then you don't try to fix that. That's never going to work. What you do is you create something better. Mm -hmm. And then everybody just naturally just leaves that and goes here. Now, it used to be some people would just come here and the majority would stay here because they're clinging to w what they've been programmed or believe in. But now, because of information, everybody's like, that's not gonna work. I already know it's not gonna work and I don't care what anybody says, this is working for me. So people are moving to new, to new, um, uh, to new applications, to new paradigms because it's working for them. So as long as we don't emotionally react to the breakdown that's happening currently in the world, and chaos is just unpredictable order, you know, as, as, as things move towards disorder, the novelty that's being created is literally chaos. Mm -hmm. Because the known and everything staying the same is order. But as you step out into that unknown, it's the, you're having the chaos is unpredictable order being expressed through novelty. And we have to be able to learn how to take that disorder and with the application of brain and heart coherence,
create more order. So you can't mm. just say, hey, I'm standing up for peace and, you know, and being, being miserable with your coworker. You, you, right. you, you don't get to talk about peace until so there's you you're the you're the living prayer of peace not just we know we know crime rates go down and violence goes down when there's peace projects in communities where there's meditation on peace but when those peace gathering projects end you know you see that crime and violence and everything returns back to the same level so it's not enough to just think it mm. we got to demonstrate it so if i'm demonstrating peace and you're demonstrating peace, somebody else, because of mere neurons, is gonna go, wow, that person's unpredictable. Wow, they're different. It's given me permission to do the same. So I think that ultimately moving into that state of being, you know, as, as human beings, and, and, and creating unity, mm-hmm. that, you know, you keep watching so many programs on television that talk you into prejudice, that talk you into separation, that talk you into fear, that talk you into violence, that talk you into war, deceit, uh, negativity, um, you're, you're not going to trust anybody. In fact, you're going to see difference between you and me or anybody because that's what separation does. But yeah. when your heart's centered and you feel connected, you don't see the person any longer, mm. right? You see something transcendent them. You see an essence, right? Yeah. And I think if you do that really well, that kind of emergence of a, of a new consciousness uh, that's less dependent on, on all of those outer things is really difficult yeah. to control. And if you want to control a community, control their emotions mm-hmm. uh, and control them in survival. Right. When you overcome your emotions, you can see the hidden meaning behind all things. And when everybody's looking this way, you may be looking that way because you understand, look, you've just overcome your fear. Yeah. You've just overcome your yeah. hostility and anger. You've overcome the program of whatever it is. I swear to you, you, you are going to be able to connect people and that That, then, is the hope of the future. Feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences. And you can remember experiences better because you can remember how they feel. And when you're in the midst of an experience, all of your senses plug you into the environment. And as you're gathering all of this vital data from your external world, all that information rushes back to your brain and it causes jungles of neurons to organize themselves into networks. The moment those neurons string into place, the brain makes a chemical, and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And once you feel that emotion, you create a long-term memory. Now reason this with me. If feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, and you are feeling the same way every single day, doesn't that mean nothing new is happening in your life? And if those feelings and emotions drive certain thoughts, and you can't think greater than how you feel, because you had events in your life that have branded you emotionally and you feel sadness or guilt or shame or unworthiness or insecurity, all of those emotions are created from past experiences. And when you feel those emotions and those emotions drive certain thoughts and then those thoughts make certain chemicals for you to feel the same emotion and then those emotions drive certain thoughts, The repetition of that cycle then conditions the body to memorize that emotional state better than the mind. And now your body literally is in the past. Because if you can't think greater than how you feel, then you are thinking in the past. And so most people then spend the majority of their life talking about why they never arrive at their vision of the future because of some past experience. And so if feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, you remember your first kiss, you remember your wedding, you remember the birth of your children, you remember catching a fish off the coast of Manzanillo with your three best friends, 
because you caught the fish and it was a new experience and you felt great. And then you went to the casita and you cooked the mahi-mahi and you drank Sauvignon Blanc and the wind was blowing off the sea and the sun was setting and you made a long-term memory. But you also have memories that are connected to trauma and crisis, to disappointments. And those are the memories that people remember more than anything else. And so if you haven't overcome some emotion that keeps you anchored to the past, then you tell a story about the past. And people say, I am this way because of this experience that happened to me 15 years ago. I am this way because of some event that happened 30 years ago. And from a biological perspective, it means I haven't been able to change in the last 15 or 30 years. And Scientific American, a prestigious magazine, says that 50% of what you talk about in your past isn't even the truth. You make it up. Because you don't have the same brain that you did 15 years ago or 30 years ago. So then your brain and body are typically in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So if you think insecure thoughts, in a matter of seconds, you are going to feel insecure. The moment you feel insecure, your brain is monitoring how you're feeling and you think more insecure thoughts, which then makes you feel more insecure. And the repetition of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind of insecurity. And then the person says, I am insecure. And whenever you say, I am anything, you are commanding your mind and body into a destiny. So then how do people change? They wait for crisis, trauma, disease, diagnosis, loss. Something has to go wrong in their life where they feel so uncomfortable that they finally make up their mind to change. And why is that? Because after the trauma or the crisis, they don't feel like of themselves. And the moment they don't feel like themselves, they could actually observe themselves. Because they're looking at themselves through the eyes of someone else. But my message is, why wait? You can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. Because you made it this far in a video, I wanna celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration. If you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below, on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. To get some incredible Bruce Lipton motivation, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. And I say, fine, did it change your life? And the answer is no. You have to take the knowledge that you are walking within your conscious mind and put that knowledge into your subconscious programming.